Hello and welcome to the West Yorkshire Football Show. It's our weekend roundup as we check in with all our teams to see how they got on. I'm Stephen Brown and joining me on tonight's show is Mr. Christopher Bell. Who's Hello, just you right? actually... Is he there? Where's Christopher Bell? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Oh, sorry. I thought you disappeared <laughs> off my screen then. I, just, I think you were hiding behind the logo. Oh, mate, you're there. You're still there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've also got Stephen Downs as well, our Huddersfield Town correspondent. We've got Mr. Jason Booker, my Leeds United pal. Uh, we've got Lewis Sale, our non-league expert as well, and Mr. Halifax Town, David Foy. And also, yeah. we've got on there, we've got Gareth Walker uh, chatting all things Bradford City. Good evening, gentlemen. Now, just before we get started, we do normally give it the whole like the video, subscribe, etc. But it does seem that some of you have been subscribing because... We reached a certain milestone earlier today. We have reached a thousand subscribers on YouTube. So there we go. Um, so I really appreciate everyone who's um, got involved there and liked the video. We really do appreciate and subscribe to the channel. So I'll keep doing it. Hopefully, here's to another thousand. Do we think? Can we? Can we do that pretty soon? Come on. All right, we all. I, I think so, yeah. But we all know that Lou's like paid people off to to to, to subscribe to this channel. He's got, he's made a million to Lewis. Yeah, I wish. Mate. I wish. Uh, Donna here, great work on hitting the thousand subs. Thank you very much, mate. We appreciate your <laughs> well. Uh, so yes, do get involved in the show. Get your comments in. Let us know how you feel about things across West Yorkshire. It was a very eventful weekend, to say the least, uh, as well. Not necessarily for the right reasons either. We don't have him for a long time, so we're going to kick things off with Bradford City and Gaz. Um, Gaz, it's a tricky one at the moment, isn't it? Because there's not much to play for, to be quite frank, is there? But it was a solid 2-1 uh, away win against Salford. Yeah, um, we've done it again, haven't we? We've gone on a little run where we've won three and drawn one and this is the thing we've been doing under Alexander it just feels like those four games in March were the ones that have cost us a playoff place or a shot at a playoff place because we've gone from like I said good run bad run good run bad run now we're on a good run again um I didn't go to the game but from what people have told me and from what I've read we were the better side and thoroughly deserved to win the game uh missed quite a lot of chances it was a case of are we ever going to score at one point um and then obviously we got one right on half time uh, to make it 1-1, having been a goal down. And then second half, again, a load more chances and finally stuck one away through worst player of the year, Brad Halliday, at the end, or two or three minutes from the end and won the game 2-1. So, Great yeah, like miss. I say, good, good, good win. Um, although Salford are probably punching where they should be in the league, but good to keep the run going. Yes, yeah, indeed. Fun. Anyone's not seen it, by the way. He properly puts his foot through it, like, across the goal. Great goal. Yeah, I believe that Graham Alexander's been uh, in his ear a little bit about contributing more at the soft end of the pitch. Now he's just scored in back-to-back -back games. So <laughs> it's obviously working. I think that's his third and fourth, either, yeah, second second and third or third and fourth goals of the season. But uh, yeah, it was a great strike. Uh, kind of lucky the way it sort of rebounded to him after Clark Adair's shot and there were nobody anywhere near him. So he just took a touch and leathered it and it flew across the goal into the far corner. So yeah, it's good to see him getting goals because he's been... Like I say, our player of the year this year, uh, far and away above everybody else, apart from maybe Alex Gilead, who's, who's also put a shift in week in, week out. But <coughs> yeah, Brad Holiday, definitely player of the year. Oh, we got Gaz getting emotional there when talking about Brad Holiday. <laughs> we understand. I just, I just he got the as well, didn't he? But I didn't bring Gaz in while he's just nearly <laughs> going. That's it. Yeah, that, that's right it. Well, well, he leaves you with the team of the year, Gaz, as well. Yeah, he got in team of the year. Yeah, not bad for a team that's only sort of 14, 15 in the league. Um, yeah, in at right back. Um, I believe that, obviously, uh, he's he's one of the... I think there's only apparently two players in our squad that we don't have an option to keep next year. And he's not one of those. So we should hopefully be able to, to tie him down and, and keep him when his contract expires at the end of the season. And that and that's going to be vital because he's, he's getting better and better. Um, I, had a I have a friend who supports Aki Stanley and he, um, he told me when we signed him that he worked great, but he's been brilliant for us. So uh, he's obviously uh, getting better. He had a horrible injury when he was at Doncaster. I believe he did his cruise shit at Doncaster and missed out um, on a year's worth of football and then, and then came here or came to City and has, has been absolutely fantastic from the get-go, really. 
Um, the only players that were better than him last season were Lewis and Cook. So, yeah, really hope that we can keep him and um, and go from strength to strength next year, him and the team. Yeah, I was going to say, is this a time, obviously, where Alexander, it, it's almost now the pressure's off. He can kind of experiment a little bit or, you know, he's looking at the loan signings who were, who were playing quite a few games now. And I guess he's just building that picture for next season. So it could actually be really useful, these these games, even though there's not a lot to play for now. It's obviously going to help him think what he needs to do with that squad for next season, you think? Yeah, he's mentioned it about a few of the players being in sort of on audition or trialling for next season about who he wants to keep. Um, it's always worrying when players turn it on at this step, sort of stage of the season. You think, like, where have you been? Where have you been all the rest of the year? But um, some of them are blatantly playing for new contracts. Fans are debating who we should keep and who we shouldn't keep. The worry for me is that we've got players under contract at the club for next season who would probably... Or, I would imagine Graham Alexander doesn't doesn't particularly rate, so they're the ones that you, you're going to be looking to move on somehow or going to struggle to move on. I think that's going to be a big job for David Sharp, who's just come in as you know head of football operations, see if he can move some of those players on. Um, big debates about who should get a new contract and who shouldn't. I think the main one's going to be Richie Smallwood. He's really, really split opinion. Um, I think that He's benefited from this. We've, we've gone to a three-five-two recently, or back to a three-five-two, and um, he's been able to just sit in midfield in the six, and then the two eights have, have sort of done the running for him. And I think that's what he needs. Um, a lot of the criticism, personally, I think he gets is because his set pieces are so poor. He shouldn't be on set pieces. He gets hammered by fans for his set pieces. They tend to be terrible. I don't think we've scored from a set piece all season, or if we have, we've done it once or twice. And it's mainly because of the delivery. I think if he wasn't on them and wasn't getting criticised for them, people might appreciate what he does do a bit more. But he's certainly not been the player we expected to sign. Uh, Probably not quite as bad as some people make out, though. Uh, The rest of the team, he has picked a couple of loanees recently. Tyreek Wright's come in um, to play left wing back in recent games. And he's given us an attacking threat down the left-hand side, which probably, I mean, he's a winger. He's, He's looked more like a winger in the last couple of games, really, even though he's been playing at wing back. So... The fact that he's playing and he's a loanee makes you think, well, have we got a chance of keeping him? Uh, similar for Daniel Oyegoki, who's been playing right-hand side his centre-half, and John Tompkinson, who's the other right-hand side his centre-half we've got. Again, they're both getting game time and um, they're both on loan. So if we're playing loanees, it makes you wonder if we've got a chance of keeping him or not. Um, but other than that, it's been quite settled, really. Probably more settled than it's been since Alexander came in, which is a bit worrying because when we were, had a chance to get in the playoffs, he was swapping and changing things and getting criticism. So maybe he's finally seen what, what the players can do and he has he has an idea in his head, like I say, with this trial that's going on for those out of contracts and he's forming a plan for next year. Yeah, indeed. Um, so kind of the season's petering out a little bit for City, but elsewhere in, in League Two, it was confirmed Stockport and Wrexham uh, have gone up. Um Glad to see the back of him. It might be a little bit of an easier league next year, do you think, Gaz? I think it could be, yeah. We've said for over a year, haven't we, or I did, that I thought the league would be really tough this year and it's proven to be the case. Uh, Also, like you say, Wrexham and Stockport going up. Uh, Notts County will still be there next year who've got money, Um, but they've not really kicked on since Mr Williams left and went to Swansea. So, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Chesterfield coming up, I would imagine that they'll spend big coming up again. So, they're going to be another money bags but other than that you would hope that it's a little bit easier than next year than it has been this year sorry um good to see i mean phil parkinson's a legend at bradford and, and i was looking and that's a fifth promotion for him that he's got now he's taken colchester up he's taken bolton up he's taken us up and now he's taken rex up twice so you know he, he, he gets criticized for his style of play but he's successful in the lower leagues and it gets teams promoted so, I mean, I'd take him back at Bradford any day of the week. Um, like you said, Stockport thoroughly deserved to win the league. I thought they were unlucky not to go up last year. It took them a while to get going last year in the first year back in the league. Uh, but once they did, they, 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 sort of, they just missed out on the autos right at the end of the season and ended up in the playoffs and then lost in the playoff final. So, I think they were always sort of nailed on to have a good shot at it this year. They look like they're going to win the league. And then Mansfield are finally looking like they're going to fulfil the potential. They've been lurking around the playoffs over the last few years, they've stuck with Nigel Clough. Aidan Flint's come in and been an absolute rock for them at centre-half and, and they look like they're going to take that third spot. So, three decent teams going up. be interesting to see what the teams are like who come down. Um, Carlisle, obviously, now got a bit of money behind them. They've signed Harry Lewis from us and 
Luke Armstrong from Harrogate. So they're spending money. So they'll probably spend money again in the summer. And then who else comes down remains to be seen, really. I think that, you know, there's a few teams down there, Cheltenham, Fleetwood. I wouldn't be particularly worried about any of them. But, uh, yeah, we'll, Bradford will have expectation next season like we always do. It's just we've got to finally build some consistency in these up and down results that we're having and uh, fulfil our potential. It's got to happen at some point. Yeah, just, exactly. just a quick one. You'll be guys. seeing Darren Moore yes. next year. <laughs> yeah, Port Vale are struggling, aren't Yeah, Vale are down there, aren't they? <laughs> They've struggled just, since he went in. Yeah. Just just a quick one, Gaz. I mean, I know we'll probably touch on it more when the season ends, but at the moment, the way things are at City, do you think City are going to act pretty quickly once the season's finished to almost, you know, announce that retain list slash release players and kind of get that plan, that plan out there as soon as possible? Because season ticket figures, actually, like you mentioned a couple of weeks ago about loyalty, isn't too bad, actually. But you feel like... There needs to be a real early momentum to go into next season for City, doesn't there? Yeah, um, they're normally pretty quick, Lou. Pretty quick off the mark. I, I, teams normally are, aren't they? they? I can't remember what the date is that they have to have it done by, but most teams are normally well, you know, a couple of weeks before that deadline. Um, City fans are always the same at this time of year. They're, they're up in arms about why we're not giving our better players contracts, uh, you know, now or earlier even in the season. Why hasn't Halliday been renewed already? Uh, but it's the way the club works. They they always wait until after the final ball's been kicked before they, they do any of that. Uh, I don't know whether that's a universal thing at other teams, but it seems to be at City. Um, you would like to think that the plans are being, like I said, formulated in Graham Alexander's head and will move quite quickly. Uh, you've also got the situation where we're not going to be in League One next year, so we know we're going to be in League Two. Yeah. Uh, in the past, we've had, like, we've talked to the... the the hierarchy at the club have talked about having two lists, you know, a list of targets for if we were in League One and a list of targets for if we're in League Two. We should be able to move quite quickly um on, on our League Two targets if we can it, you know, and, and 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 get some of those over the line early. Uh, I believe, like you say, season tickets have been well, it was announced that they were just short of ten thousand. Um I think it was last Thursday morning and then early afternoon Graham Alexander said in the press conference that they were over eleven thousand. So they'd sold a thousand that morning. I think that was a deadline for swapping seats. It probably prompted a few people to to renew. So I would imagine that we'll be up at around twelve thousand by the time we uh, the the deadline. You know, the, the the they go off sale, which isn't bad considering that we've had a poor season. So they've also mm-hmm. prices have gone up too. So the fact that we might have a three thousand drop off in total because it was fifteen thousand last year. We've dropped. I'm guessing we're going to drop to about twelve. That'll be negated by the little price increase that there's been. So you would imagine the budget's going to be similar to what it was this year. Mm. Um, and Stefan's also um, hinted at in his in his open letter that he'll be putting a bit of money in as well to sort of to, to, to sort to uh, support the budget. So there's every chance that we can move early, get some targets in, get the players we want renewed, and, and hopefully have a good year next year. Although every football fan's saying that, aren't they? So we'll see. Yeah, no, I think I think that's really fair, mate. I think it's really good analysis and overview about you. It's cool. Good stuff. Okay, well, uh, Gaz, thank you very much. Just before we go, um, we let you go, rather. Uh, Walsall up next. Um, thoughts on that one, mate? Uh, Walsall, few places above us in the league. Maybe slightly more a chance of the playoffs than we than we have. I think they've surprised a few people this year. Um, people thought that they'd struggle. Uh, I remember they came to Valley Parade around end of September time and it was one of the games, I think it was just before Hughes left and, and fans were absolutely up in arms. They beat us 3-1 and that was one of the t- big turning points against Hughes. But they've surprised people. I believe they play some decent football. So it'll be a tough game. They're, like I said, they're going for the playoffs. Um, I'm going down to Walsall because me and my mates always do the last away game. So, uh, yeah, we, it isn't actually the last away game now because we, we've had Barrow rearranged for a third time, which will be next Tuesday night. Um, so... But yeah, we you would hope that the way we're playing at the moment that we can we can make a game of it and, and get three points. But like I said, we're so Jekyll and Hyde. Any team that finds consistency, we need to be one of the teams that finds consistency, and hopefully that that can be next season. Uh, if it's not now, brilliant, uh, Gaz. Thank you so much for popping on, mate. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night, pal. Yeah, happy birthday to my missus too. So I'll yeah, uh, have happy a good birthday, night, Mrs. Uh, speak Gaz. To you later. Later. <laughs> <It's too> late, <laughs> happy birthday, Mrs. Gaz. Happy birthday to her. Bye.
Bye bye, bye bye. Um, okay, there we go. So that's League Two covered. So we're going to move on to. Oh God, do we have to do this? The Championship. Um, <laughs> it's painful all round. Uh, Jason, we'll, we will start with League United. Um, let's let's relive it. Uh, we did our match review uh, a few minutes after full time uh, against Blackburn at the weekend. It was League United nil, Blackburn one. We did. I think over an hour stream after that game. So if anyone wants kind of in-depth analysis or raw emotion after the final whistle for that game, do Both. check that out on there. Yeah, indeed. More raw emotion from me and I think analysis from Jay, to be honest. Um, but Jason, it's a couple of days on now. Um, in the cold light of day, all the teams at the top did drop points. Obviously, Ipswich have gained on us. But I mean, how, how are you feeling about it now? I mean, for me, it, that did feeling the day after a game like that is just awful, isn't it? I mean, we texted yeah. Sunday morning, didn't we? And we were like, this is just shocking. But uh, how are you feeling about it now? Yeah, it, I mean, pretty flat, to be honest. I mean, it's made even worse for us, I think, because we've got a long break to the next game or a longer break than normal because we don't play until Monday. And next week, we've got Monday, Friday, two tricky away games. Um, so, yeah, flat, mate. Um, but... Like I always do, I always try and deal with everything objectively without too much emotion where I can try and, you know, try and reason with myself as to as to why things are happening in a certain way or, you know, was the performance that bad? Was it actually OK? Was it a good performance? You know, this, this all kind of thing go, goes through my head. I mean, I sent you a bit of a breakdown and analysis of the goal. The goal absolutely infuriated me. The more I watched it, the more I, I got annoyed by it. Um, the defense. I love this. Can I just say, by the way, this was brilliant. I woke up on Sunday morning. Jade sent me like, I don't know if anyone subscribes to the Athletic, but what they'll do is they'll do like match reviews and they'll have like screenshots from the game and a little passage. That's exactly what Jay said. I was like, this is brilliant, mate. If you could just do this for every game, that'd be fantastic. Well, I mean, I, I love football. I love analyzing football. I love watching stuff. And, uh, you know, my, we've not conceded. I remember a few weeks ago we were talking about not conceding chances, let alone goals. And, you know, when them kind of things happen, I always kind of look back at them because I think sometimes you just have to like, admit we've conceded a good goal or a screamer or a well-built goal and you just say you know what fair play that wasn't the case on Saturday I mean it was literally a goal that you would see in non-league it was a long ball from the goalkeeper's goal kick not even from his hands a flick on one pass and they'd scored it was it was a terrible terrible goal to concede um the, the changes that we were happening in we had happening in that stage of the game i think were fully to blame you know byron had just come onto the pitch grew had just come off the pitch archie gray was then put in a position where he was asked to do a defensive midfield role he takes up the wrong area of the pitch and gets completely caught out of position it, it, it was just a, a a mistake after mistake and you know the ball then ends up falling you know, 15 yards out to probably the the person that you would want it to fall to least from a Leeds perspective in Sammy Schmodix. And he, he took it away. You knew the second that he was one-on-one -on -one with Melier was going in. Um, Melier, for me, there's nothing really he could do. He puts it back the way that he comes. It looks like it's one of them where it looks like the keeper could maybe do more. But the fact is Schmodix plays it back away from Melier's momentum. He did, it, 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 it's a it's a good finish. It's a tidy finish. But yeah, that really irritated me, mate. So, but to, to kind of build on how I feel about it, like this is happening all over the league for a start. West Brom have, have dropped off a little bit. The only team that have found any sort of form is Southampton. But over the five, the previous five, they've only won two. They've won the last two, um, and they had a, a hundredth minute handball goal against Watford to do that. And, you know, we were, we were all chatting on Sunday about what's happening in the Premier League. And we see Liverpool and Arsenal both lose at home <laughs> in a title running. Like, it, pressure does funny things to teams and to players. And, you know, a lot of Leeds fans are kind of looking over this. They've looked over it all season in that we have the, you know, the second youngest squad in the whole division. By Sunderland, we, we have the youngest squad in the division. And as much as talent's important experience, you know, know-how, been there before, done it before and all the rest of it, um, it is vital. It, it's massively vital. And me and Lewis spoke about experience a lot in, in Avenue's ranks this season. You know, the, the amount of points that, that um, Avenue, as an example, have lost from winning positions this season, that happens because of a lack of experience. These results, when push really comes to shove, are, are, are happening because... I think a lack of experience. I mean, if you'll indulge me for just a minute, because I, I was doing a bit of uh, recce earlier. 
Um, I, I know I went through and had a look at the the perform well, highlighted the performances where I didn't think Leeds were great in, but in that winning run, because I thought I I think it's it's really really important to to kind of hold this as a bit of perspective for Leeds and for Leeds fans. In that run, we we started off the the run at the beginning of, of January with a couple of good results. I won't go through them all one by one, but we beat Birmingham and Cardiff three 0 didn't we? Early on in in January, but we then beat, beat Preston at home in a close two one game. We scored in the last minute a penalty. We beat Norwich one 0 at home, a game that we probably didn't deserve to win. Browner, I don't know if you remember back to that. Norwich were a good side and they, they yeah. played really really well that day. Um, we beat Bristol City one 0 away. We squeaked it over the line. Um, Rotherham at home, we needed a Bamford handball to set us on his way that day. If you remember, he elbows it in. Mm. Um, Plymouth away, we didn't play particularly well in Leicester at home. We should have been done and out of sight in that game. A lot of you watched that game. Um, Huddersfield, we we go to Huddersfield and draw. And um, Stoke at home, and Lou watched that game and said that we were comfortable, but we won one nil and we only just got it over the line. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday away. They played really well for the first half. Millwall mm-hmm. at home, the day that we went, ended up going top of the league. We, we needed an 87th minute second goal to make sure of that game. Um, Watford 2 2, Hull 3 1 the other week. I would say all them games that I've mentioned there, I would argue that the performance against Blackburn at the weekend was just as good as a lot of them. The big difference was the key moments in them games. We didn't take them key moments. We didn't, the chance didn't quite fall for us in the way that it had done in some of them games. I think of the the, the game where Bamford scored from being on his ass. <laughs> he fell over and the ball just fell at his feet and then he tapped it in. Like we, we haven't had them moments. At the weekend, we had a lot of chances. We had a lot of chances to score the goal. Might not have been shots on goal, but like think of the, the, the pass across the box that Nonto missed by half a yard. You know, yeah, I, I felt it was like I felt for the first thirty minutes it was like a, not, I don't want to say classic Leeds performance this season, but it felt in that that mode. It felt like a goal is coming, um, but then you know after you don't score after thirty minutes, that's when that pressure gets ramped up. And for me, second half it just <laughs> kind of fell away for whatever reason. These teams are coming, you know, especially a Blackburn. They're, they're coming setting up with two banks of of. Well, one of five and one of four, six yards outside of their, their the penalty spot, pretty much. They are camped there for the whole game. Now, no matter who you are, whether you have the most talented players in, in the world, that is difficult to break down. And the longer it goes at nil-nil, the more difficult it becomes, the more tricky yeah. it comes to end up winning them games and finding that moment. We score in that first half. The game goes into a 3 4 nil. I'm absolutely confident that it does because Blackburn are forced to come out. They've got no choice but to come out and to try and take the game to us. But they ended up executing a perfect game plan. You know, they had a couple of chances apart from the the goal that they caught us on the counter-attack. And that ended up, it probably confirms them as safe. They've probably Mm -hmm. got enough points on the board now to be safe. So when they're going into that game, that's a vital moment. They're playing probably for just as much as us, really. You know, in, in the grand scheme of things. So, Leeds fans sometimes, and I think this this goes for Ipswich and, well, maybe not Ipswich, but certainly Leicester fans as well, is there's this kind of ego, kind of, you know, we're Leeds United, we're Leicester City, we should win this game no matter what. The other team should just come and roll over. And that's not how football's played out. It's just not how it works. Um, you know, so... <sighs> There's elements of frustration from that game. Could we have played better? Sure, yeah. But we've also played a lot worse on one games this season. We've played a lot worse than the weekend on one games. So for, for me, I don't think we're a million miles away from what we need over this next few games to, to get enough points to, to still take us up. And no. Ipswich and Leicester still dropping well, points. Not... Sorry, go on, Dad. No, I, I, I was just, I was just going to come in, Jay, that I, I obviously watched the game and then watched what you had to say on the Sunday, and I thought you were really fair. To be fair, in your um, in in your comments about the game, I, I think you know, for me watching Leeds, I was disappointed with the finishing. I thought you you had quite a few chances that you just didn't put away. You know, Bamford. Um, uh, you know, 
in terms of the other the other chances that you had. I didn't think Somerville was good again, to be honest. So that it it's just unfortunate for you guys, you know, that that some some players are just faltering at the at the wrong time. And I do think you've been worse after that international break. I do I do agree that with Steve that that had a massive effect. Um, the only thing that I want to add is um, basically that my favourite bit of the review show. <laughs> my favourite bit of the re- the review show is when he called Leeds fans knobheads. That, that was I didn't fantastic. call them knobheads. I, I just I want to clarify. I didn't call them knobheads. I called them morons. <laughs> and I specifically called the one... That subscriber figure's just dropping, isn't it? I just specifically. <laughs> and I, I mean, any Leeds, fan, any Leeds fan I believe that's watching this should agree with me. I, I called the, the Leeds fans morons that were booing at full time. Yeah. It was the first yeah. loss that we've suffered at home all season in our second to last home game of the season have some perspective have, have, have some respect i would say to to the team and to the management and for, for for orchestrating the fact that we've not seen a home defeat all season up until that point and let's not pretend like we played terribly at the weekend blackburn still smashed and grabbed that game they're 25 percent possession like they have five shots on goal all game to our 19 or something like that's football. It happens. But so you agree you should have won it. You agree? I think we should. Yeah. We, we should have won you, the game. You agree that you missed chances, though. You know, Bam- Bamford yeah. should score that header, shouldn't it? Look, you know. But the thing is, all football teams miss chances that they should take in every game. <laughs> yeah, they they all miss chances. You know, championship strikers are playing championship football because they're not that clinical. Or <laughs> as often as, as they should be to then be a Premier League striker. We're trying to get into the Premier League, so we've got players that are going to miss chances. And at this stage of the season, for some of these players, when the pressure's kicking, composure goes out the window and they do, unfortunately, miss chances that they shouldn't. I, I, I just see it with a, 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 the, the air of reality to it, Brownie. That, that's can, I just how say, I it. can I just say this? Hey, this is not to drag up the Bamford thing, because Law knows we've heard enough about that debate. But <laughs> all I would say is... I just wonder if we'd have just tried Joseph in the last maybe two or three games. I mean, what would we have lost? What would we have well, lost, really? The, the I, thing, I, we may have given us something. <laughs> the only thing I will say to that, I mean, bear in mind at the weekend, we didn't start Bamford, right? Hmm. We we did not have a chance like Bamford's header until Bamford came on. So you ask yourself the question as about the players that were then playing in that position before Bamford came on. Why are they not taking up them positions? Now, and I, I hear it that Bamford misses too many chances. He absolutely does. He's not the striker that I want to see us play week in, week out. I wish we had somebody better. And certainly if we do go up, we're going to need somebody better to replace him. But we didn't create... Why isn't Perot on the end of a chance like that? He was still on the pitch at that moment. Bit, for me, that was a big mistake. Perot yeah. coming in but for Bamford was I, a big mistake. We make the point about Joseph, and I hear it. I'm not saying that I, don't, I didn't want Joseph to start at the weekend, right? But... Over the last two or three performances that Joseph's played, I've seen him miss sitters too. He missed he missed from three yards out the week before when he hit the post, and then I think we scored not long after. I think that might have been against Hull when we then won the penalty. Oh. He missed, he scuffed the effort against Watford when he equalised. He scuffed it, it came back off the defender. The defender tried to clear it, it hit Joseph and went in. Who so, would you like, back? Who would you back to score? Who's more likely to get you a goal at the moment, Joseph or Bamford, in your in your opinion? Coming on in the 80th minute, Matteo Joseph, or coming on in the 60th minute, Matteo Joseph. But starting the game, having that pressure on a 19, 20-year-old kid, when Ellen Rhodes beaming down on you, and you've never been in that position ever before, you've never been in that situation ever before, what if he misses Brownie after five minutes and goes missing for 60 minutes? Like, I, I'm not... I'm not advocating for for this Bamford <laughs> fan club that people think that I'm in, right? I, I'm really, I'm really, really not. But I, what I'm saying is, is, if Daniel Farker's making that decision, then you have to back it because it makes logical sense. It makes, <laughs> it just makes sense. Why is it? Yeah. He's shown that he's prepared to play Archie Gray over Jed Spence at right back, over Luke Ayling at right back. Given that he's a 17 year old centre midfielder, he's shown that he's prepared to play a kid. In that main team, over experienced starting players, if they're good enough, right? So I can only come to the conclusion that on the weekly basis, when he's seeing it in training, 
that, that he, he go, he, he's left with no option but to pick Bamford over him. Do you find it bizarre though when we have seen Perot and Bamford to get uh, sorry Perot and Rutter together for a large part of the season and it kind of it really started to not work and we lost that back back <laughs> game and then Bamford came in and changed it and I just think. I don't. I don't understand why Farker did that. Why yeah. Farker brought yeah. Pirro back in? I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Wait, say again, Chris. Can I just kind of ask a question on Pirro? Because like, what's he on this season? Right, is it 11, 12 goals so 12, far? Yeah, twelve. And you know, he joined off the back of two twenty-plus goal scenes at Swansea. How like how's he getting on? Like why? Because I'll be honest, I don't see a great deal of love for Joel Pirro, and they're thinking the he's an out-and-out striker, or at least he was at Swansea. The problem is Chris is not. And in, in a Swansea side, he played alongside Obafemi. He played in a front two and he, he was given foils. He's not quick. He's not particularly strong, but he's an out and out natural finisher. Yeah. He, he, he's a natural a natural finisher. There's nobody at the club that I would want one on one more than Perot. He's the man that I would put in front of anybody else. Somerville, Rutter, Bamford, Joseph, all of them. I'd put Perot. He's cool. He's cold in front of goal most of the time. He did miss <laughs> last week when he should have should have got an equaliser against Coventry. But he he is he, he's a he's a good he's very very good in front of goal. He doesn't fit our system. We should yeah. not have signed him. We've seen that more and more as the season's gone on. We didn't want him. We wanted Cameron Archer. Cameron Archer went to Sheffield United, and we ended up with our second choice in Yol Perot. He's not a replacement for for a Bamford. Um, Daniel Facker was right when he said uh, Georgina Rutter has to play as the as the nine and he has to play as the ten if them two are going to play together because Piro has not got the pace to trouble defenders in behind. He literally trumbles over, doesn't he, Brownie? Like, we, we've watched him enough to yeah, see. Yeah, it's frustrating to watch. Yeah, it's frustrating it to watch. I mean, he was actually... I mean, at the start of the season, he, he, you could see he had that kind of impetus. He had the big fee. He had the reputation. And you kind of see his confidence kind of dwindle. And again, you know, it was a big opportunity for him at the weekend. If he starts against Blackburn, if he scores, if he plays well, he's probably going <laughs> to place for the rest of the season. I don't think he yeah. does now. I think he no, drops back to bench appearances again. Be, I, I'm, just, I'm just frustrated because I, I I totally get what you're saying about young players, but I think sometimes a young player can not be burdened by that stuff. And I think experience is great, but to me, he just looks ready, Jason. I just think we've just got to give this guy a go, but I'm, I'm kind of fearing that it's already a bit too late. I think I think if it was you know nothing to play for, we'd already box the playoffs off, and there were no option of getting the top two. I think you'd see Joseph starting every week. I, I truly do believe that. Or if we were mid table, I think you'd see Joseph starting every week. But at this moment, you, you've got a crossroads, haven't you? And the, the, for for Farker, given that he's the one that's paid to do this to make this deci- decision, it more logic says to take the Bamford route. We've been here before with this conversation. It's literally like being in 2019, 2020 again. And we're talking about Bamford and what he offers the team as opposed to him missing chances. Um, again, if you just kind of um, indulge me for just another second, because I was listening to the square ball earlier and um, Phil Hay was talking about um, when Howard Wilkinson won 1992 Premier League. I don't, did you, have you listened to it, Brownie? I don't, I don't yeah, know yeah. Is it the Phil Hay one from today? Yeah. yeah. From today. Yeah, but he it, it, the, the quote that Howard Wilkinson used at the time. I uh, don't want to get this wrong. Uh, where did I put it? Trust in your swing was was the yeah. the quote that Howard Wilkinson put to it back then. We went to Manchester City and lost four nil, and they weren't the Manchester City that they are today. They were relegation for it. We lost four nil against Manchester City, and Howard Wilkinson came out on the back of that and started the exact same team that lost 4-0 and he started them for the rest of the season. And they won all but one game um, where he made one change away at Liverpool where he dropped Gordon Strachan. I just thought it were a fantastic piece on man managing a, a, yeah. a, a, a pressure situation like this because there is two ways of looking at it and the fans, I, I want to be careful how I word this, but the uneducated opinion to it is, is that, oh, just change a player. J- just change this player and it'll all be fixed. Well, we made three changes at the weekend. And I would argue in that area of the pitch, we were worse than not having Bamford in the side. I think Nonto made a difference. I I thought Archie was poor in centre midfield. I'm just going to call it for how it was. I thought Kamara would have been better in there. And Connor Roberts, I think him or Archie at right back, I don't think it would have made much of a difference. So I would argue that the calls for changes were wrong. You know, I understand why they were happening, but I would argue that they were wrong. 
the Bielsa season, we came back after COVID and lost 2-0 away at Cardiff, right? Yeah. You'll remember that. Yeah, we were poor. Marcelo Bielsa then, we won all but one game between then and the end of the season. I think it was seven games, six wins, one draw against Luton. And he started exactly the same team in every single game that lost against Cardiff until the promotion was confirmed and we played Derby and we, we beat him when we were pissed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. The, the point is, again, when push, when push comes to shove, make plan A better. Yeah, work yeah. on plan A. We've just had three... Three players, I'm sorry, I'm going on, but we just had three players um, in, inducted into the team of the season. They've not got there by accident. We've got one of the best 11. I argue that we have got the best 11 on in the division. Yeah, so now is not the time to start making kamikaze changes to this team. The big problem that we have, Brownie, is that goals don't come from other places in, in the team. Midfield. We we have not had a single goal, guys. You probably won't be able to believe this. We've not had a single goal from midfield this season. Not one single goal in a team that's two points off top. Not not a single goal from Kamara, Ampadu, Gray. None of them that have played centre midfield. Kamara gets in some great positions, but he just the man refuses to shoot. I don't think I've ever seen him shoot. They've had a combined total of twenty six shots on goal Over all the whole season. season. Over the whole it's season, really bad. Yeah, wow. yeah. So yeah, the, when you're talking about Bamford, is the is the problem, and we're not scoring goals because of Bamford. It, it, it's yeah. not as simple as that. It's yeah. not as simple as that. Is yeah. is there um is there an argument for for both of you guys? And this is really difficult because I agree with everything, pretty much everything you said, to be honest. And obviously, you've been on an amazing run to get you out of that position where you were at the beginning of the season. Is there uh, a question mark over Farka potentially not trying enough different scenarios and situations earlier on in the season to give you more options like you're finding yourself in now for example and obviously like Joseph you've made an example maybe a couple of system changes but he's got something to call on that the players have been familiar with in big game or game situations that he can count on personally I think in January when the run started he did change it I think Brownie will, will back me up with that not only the personnel changes that happen stylistically we changed in the way that we were playing what's what has happened recently i think is that the players are starting to struggle with some of the pressure and what they're doing is is the funneling it to some of them yeah. which is making this extremely predictable yeah uh, and then teams are becoming it's becoming easier for teams to defend against us i think the game states have changed too and like i said i don't think there's a huge performance change between the games that we're winning before the international break and now the international break has definitely hit us. The Watford yeah. game and the game um, after, even though we beat Hull, um, I think we saw a real fall off from that because of injuries coming back into the side. Mm -hmm. We have some real key players that that make this team tick: Gruev, Rutter, Somerville. If they're not at it, the system doesn't work. We saw it under um, Daniel Facker at Norwich. If Buendia didn't play, Norwich didn't win. I think their average points per game was something like 0 0.8. And with Buendia in the team, it was 2.2. There's literally a, a, a world of difference. Mm. So if the 10 doesn't click, and again, Brownie, I'm sure that you'll back me up with this, Rutter hasn't been the same. I would say probably for two games before the international break, he then had the earlier operation. And then since then, he, he, he's mm. not been the same. Losing the ball too often, not strong, not as quick, not as on it. Um, and, and it's making a huge difference to, to the way that we then play. I don't blame him for that. He's young. You know? yeah. Yeah. Is, is, I mean, I listen as well on the radio, going to one of the games on Saturday and yourselves as well afterwards. Somebody, I can't remember where I listened to and what they said, is there was an also potential argument of we don't score enough from set pieces as well. I don't know what you guys yeah. have thought about oh, that as well. We're just, we're so unthreatening. Yeah. We're just completely like unthreatening. The amount of corners. It's so important, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think it's now 260-something corners without a goal. Um, and previously to us... Say again? Not that you're counting. Not that we're counting, no. And and, and previously to the, the goals starting to kind of trickle in from open play, the only goals that we'd conceded this year in 16 games, I think it was, was three corners. So, yeah, I, I don't think we have a lot of natural height. Um, mm. we're not we're not a particularly big team. Um, as midfielders are not robust, kind of strong type of. So you know, as full backs are a little bit 
light, I would say, as well. Um, so it's not a huge surprise. I think every team has an Achilles heel, right? And I think that's that's ours. Um, but yeah, I would certainly like to see more goals from corners. I mean, I saw somebody sum it up perfectly the other day. And when we get a corner, I'd almost prefer us to just kick it out for a goal kick because the biggest threat, <laughs> the biggest threat that we have is getting hit on the counter. We've seen counter, it so often yeah. because the set piece is so ineffective. It's not even the delivery. The delivery is usually pretty good, but it's the attacking of the header, the, the way that we kind of create that situation inside the box. I mean, Joe Rodon has never scored a professional goal. I find that unbelievable. He's six foot two and he's, he's great in the air as a defender, but he's never scored a professional goal. Um, Ampadu... Yeah, it's mental. Ampadu's five foot eleven. He's great in the air, but attacking set pieces again, he just doesn't get on the end of them. The only so does he haven't got his sideshow Bob Air anymore? That's why. Yeah, no. <laughs> the only real threat that we've ever had from a set piece this season is Pascal Schroik, who's got a fifty p head, but he does manage to to what well, he does. Dave, honestly, it bounces. Yeah, off no, it's just a great. It's just a great term. Sorry, yeah. You know, right, it just great, go, yeah. goes off in all sorts of directions, but he can attack yeah, a set know, piece. Yeah. It can create problems. So, and he's obviously been out now for four months or whatever it is. So, yeah, it's a it's a problem, Lou. But other than creating something out of maybe some short corners, I don't really see how we we change yeah. it. You know, it's hard to criticise when you've we've, when you've clawed all them points back in there. And I agree with what you guys are saying at the weekend. It's you just don't want that good work to go to waste to get you into that top two because that playoff is it's a lottery, isn't it? But yeah. if you guys can somehow listen, you guys know better than me and probably better than all us on this panel is that you know you. You recognise that you're good enough to go in top two. You, you're good enough to probably win the next games that are coming up. It's just has got to be a slight tweak to things and just probably get the rub of the green to go up automatically. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you completely. I think to to, to kind of sum up because I know you're going to be keen to move on because I've talked for a long time. <laughs> Seems like I've had a lot to say, but um, we've got a huge two weeks now. Uh, you know. Before Ipswich play again, we will only have one game. So we play two games before Ipswich play again. Uh, because of the Coventry semi-final this weekend, they've not got a game, and then they play on the Saturday after we played on the Friday. So we play Monday, Friday. Two big away games against two teams that probably are going to have to come out and try and beat us. Um, Middlesbrough have got pretty much nothing to play for, but a slim opportunity of getting the playoffs. Um, we should be able to go up there and beat them if they're coming out and having a go at us, I think. Um, and QPR away, if they don't win this weekend, the likelihood is, is that they will have to probably get at least a point um, to to have some sort of hope of staying up on the final day because of the way that the bottom end's going. So I hope that both them games away from home, I think actually could suit us. I think we need to take six points. I, and I know I say that now from a perspective of, you know, we've all been dropping points, in which Lesser have been dropping points as well, nearly as, as often as we have. Um, but I think given the psychological situation that we will find ourselves in, that Ipswich will have three games left to play and we will only have one, if that gap isn't four points, they go into it thinking, we've got a bit of breathing room here. We can actually get away with having a bit of a slip up. So we need to make sure that we're taking six out of six. If we don't, I think it'll be the playoffs. That That's just how I see it. And it's stinky. Um, it's a, it's a boob prize. But... I, I mean, do any of you disagree with that? I, 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 no, no, I, I, I looking at the top of the table, I, I agree. I think you, you look at Southampton, um, I think it'd be a miracle for them to get in the top two, really, from their position. But it's doable, but they've got to win pretty much every game. Um, you guys, I think I agree, you've got to take six out of six. I think Ipswich have got a chance for a slip up. They, they're the only, them and Leicester, I think, are the only two that can get to 98 now. Yeah. I don't think you can. Leicester can do 100 still because they've got a game. Yeah, but my, my point is, Jay, is basically, <laughs> you know, they win all their games. It's it's a non complete isn't it? Um, the, the problem you have, and the scary thing I think Leeds have, is. Then the playoffs, I know I've mentioned it before and you hate the fact that I've said it, but there's so much pressure. I think you've crumbled a little bit in these last couple of weeks with the pressure. Not like crumble, crumble, don't get me wrong, but I think you are feeling it and the younger lads, I agree, in the squad are feeling it. And I and I just think there's way too much pressure on, on the playoffs if, if you go into them. I, I just I, feel I, there is. Sorry. I, I I don't think they'll even be thinking about it yet, if I'm honest. I, I genuinely don't. I think there's so much to play for in these next three that I don't even think the pressure of playing in the playoffs will even have entered the, the Reds. 
No, you're when right, it comes right. well. Yeah, 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 but but it's irrelevant right now because we're still in a three-way tie. The, the fact yeah. that if we were to win all three games, I think we'll go up. Well, I, I, I feel almost certain we will because yeah. we're, we're the same conversation that Leeds fans are having. Ipswich and Leicester fans are having as well. I mean, I watch a lot of content and they are freaking out, especially Leicester fans. <laughs> they're proper flapping. And they're still the team that have uh, bottled a 17-point gap. That's still hanging over them. So I, I, I don't think it's anywhere near done. Um, and we're more than capable of winning three out of three games. We so, need our... No, I was just going to say, we need our Hernandez versus Swansea moment, don't we? We need something like that just to... Yeah, I mean, food, Pablo Hernandez is a great, great kind of example of what I'm talking about when it comes to experience because he's not worried in their moments, he's not panicking mm. in them, them, them moments, he's not letting the, the occasion deal with him. You know, I watched the goal against Swansea the other day, it takes a touch off the defender and he has to readjust and then yeah. play it into the one area of the, the goal where the keeper can't get it and, and he pulls that off. We haven't quite got that at the moment, and that, that is the, the big difference. But look, Leeds fans need to keep their heads. You know, and I would say the same if I were a Leicester or an Ipswich fan because there's there's so much to play for. Ipswich and Leicester are not going to win all their games. We've all shown that we we you know we're not perfect. There's two points in it to top one win. We might only need one win. That's the crazy thing, Brownie. With three games to go, one win could actually do it. Yeah, it probably I, I, won't, but I, it, it could. I think what it is, and you, I think you've hit the nail on the head, Jared. Is all three of you have shown at the moment that you're not you're capable of slipping up. And as simple as this sounds, it's going to be the team who doesn't drop points that's going to go up automatically. And I know that sounds a really simple thing to say, but that is going to be the case. If you get six points, like you say, you, you go up automatically. Leicester do the same, don't they? It's because you do the same. You've just got to make sure that you don't drop them points that, you've, that ironically, you've done in the past two games. I think, I think again, I, I want to kind of move on because I, I know I've been talking a long time. I think it's just because of this situation with the three games and then only having one to play with Ipswich to play three, I think there's a psychological twist in that that that's, can be fantastic for us and fantastic against us. If we only take two points out of them two away games as an example, we're going to be level on Ipswich and Ipswich are going to have three games left to play. Yeah. That is a completely different world to if we win these next two and they've got a four-point gap to claw back. They, they play them games completely differently. Um, it's horrible how it's worked out, really. I'm, I'm sure that nobody would have, you know, anticipated that Coventry had got to a semi-final. There's nothing you can do yeah. about it. It is what it is. Um, but I, I do think it's massive. I think it's absolutely massive. Yeah, from a neutral perspective, um, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> Stevie, thanks for your comments, mate. He's, <laughs> he's not a fan of the playoffs. Uh, squad are too young to handle the playoffs. They cannot beat Sunderland's low block. We are knackered. But we're not going to be playing against the Sunderland low block. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're not in in the playoffs. We, we're not going to be playing that. You know, likely it is is we'd play Norwich and we've beaten them twice. So I, I hear it, and you know, I could be if, if we lose in the playoffs, we're losing the playoffs. It's a lottery, right? It, it, it is what it is. It won't be because we lost in the playoffs six years ago. It be because this team have not been able to handle the the, the situation and win a game of football. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that yeah. for me. Great stuff. Um, just a quick final word on Leeds, I promise. Uh, Somerville Player of the Year at the EFL Awards, Jason. Uh, richly deserved. I mean, what a fantastic year he's had. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you could make cases for all three of them. Um, Dewsbury Hall, um, Cree Somerville and and um, Sammy Schmodix as well. I think Sammy Schmodix and what he's done in a, in a terrible team, really, in a relegation-threatened team up until the weekend, I think shows the talent of, of him as a player. Um, so I wouldn't have argued if it had gone to all three of them, to be honest. But I think he, I think Cree deserves it. You know, he's, yeah. him and Rutter this season have basically single-handedly carried this team from an attacking point of view anyway. Yeah. Um, and great to see uh, Archie pick up the um, Young Player of the Year and the Academy um, Academy Player of the Year as well. I don't think that was ever in doubt. I think he's head and shoulders above, above anybody else in the league, personally. Indeed. Um James, thanks for your comment. One of Town's few performances were against Ipswich. We may do us both a favour on the last day. So with Ta that, let's... Town are, Town are going to win that last game of the season. Send us up and go down anyway. Come on, What's Terriers. Happening? Get it sorted. Up the Terriers. Up the Terriers, yeah. <laughs> um, Steve, we're going to we're gonna move on to Huddersfield Town now. And for anyone who's <laughs> not seen it, yourself and Lou were on stream yesterday giving your thoughts on, uh, on Huddersfield Town's draw against Bristol City. I mean, controversial doesn't even kind of sum it up really, but um, how are you feeling now a couple of days on um, from that, that game there? 
Uh, pretty still angry, bit uh, twisted, and uh, overall good. Um, thank you, thank first you of well. all, for Lou Apple stepping into uh, Callum's feet, uh, shoes, sorry, um, at, at the late stage. Uh, so cheers, mate. Thanks very much for that. Um, no but yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was it was a difficult decision, to be honest, to take right at the death, ninetieth minute, um, well, nine a hundredth minute actually. You know, five minutes added on um, by Rebecca Welsh, the referee. Um, we played five minutes. A town player went down injured for thirty seconds. A substitute was made, which counts for forty-five seconds. Uh, the penalty was given on the 99th minute, which is four minutes later. So even if you add on the time for the substitution and the injured player, we still should have been going into the changing rooms 1-0 up and three sat here with three points, but we're not. We drew. Ollie Turton was said to handball um, and the penalty was given. It was never a handball in a million years. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it single handedly relegated the club. And thanks to Rebecca Walsh for costing us five point five million pound in broker. Oh, yeah. That's Have not true, though, is it, Steve? No, it's, it's just not true, is it? After forty two games, no, I'm it's just not true, is it? No, I'm, no, 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 it's not true. No, no, we've been crap all season, and and you know, but but those decisions do do hurt, you know, particularly in the circumstances that we're in. Um, and I and I actually feel, you know. We've had debates in the WhatsApp group all season about officiating, but the fact that that decision could be so costly to our, to my football club, and yes, I've got a bias in it, questions need to be asked about the refereeing standards in this country. And listen, for everybody watching, right, it's not just because she's a woman refereeing. I'm not going to sit here and be Joey Barton because I think women in the men's game, it, 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 it is a good thing. We need to be progressive. Um, and, and I'm fully supportive of everything that the women's game do too. But judging her on being a referee, it was not good enough. And she she's refed us twice this season and cost us points. And I wouldn't even give her two out of ten. Well, then again, I wouldn't give a lot of the referees two out of ten this season because I think they have been abysmal. So it's been devastating, um, but yeah, we come away with a point, and we're going to last fee three fixtures, literally clinging on now to, you know, some hope of of something happening. You, you guys, what happens to teams that are struggling, isn't it? Sorry, Chris. Sorry, I just talked to eight, you eight people talk at the same time. Yeah, they all just jumped in, didn't we? That's Chris, impressive. go first. That is impressive. Um, no, you know it, it's a harsh decision, but you, I've seen him giving another games as well of equal kind of how poor a decision was. It's not like it was all against Huddersfield in that case. It's just one of those things that happened. I know it's a Chris, situation to take, but Chris, it was terrible. You can't oh, stick up for a decision like that. You know, yeah, it's, I think it was the right yeah. decision. No, but I've said I've seen him giving another games. Like it's not yeah. a one-off spare of the moment. You know, spur spur thing. It's happening in other games, up and down the country, in every league in the country. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And that's what tells you the state of the referee. Deal with it. Um, but it's I understand the frustration that we've got four games to go, which put you in a difficult position. But I personally, I said, I said to you in the group chat, I've seen her have some very good games, actually. A couple of games last season. Um, and she was one of the best referees that I've seen. It's just on the day, isn't it? Some referees have good days and bad days. It's as simple as that. So they're the Chris kind of decisions that go against no teams that are struggling. Aren't yeah. they? They're the sort of decisions that go against teams at the wrong end of the table. They're the sort of penalties that they concede. If you were top of the league, you wouldn't have conceded that penalty. They just it just seems to be the laws of the, the literal laws of physics of football. Struggling teams get decisions like that against them. But the problem with that, Dave, is and I agree with it, right? But the issue is relegation costs people jobs. I know. At I understand. Yeah, clubs. It does. And and I know that you know that as well, but but you know some people don't, and you know I'm not saying that that decision will relegate us. We've been crap all season, so if we go down, we deserve to go down. But that three points took us from being on 46 points, a point behind Stoke and QPR, to now yeah. back to 43, uh, 44 points, being three points behind them with two games to play, even though we've got Birmingham to play. So. To me, it was a disastrous uh, 
decision to be given. And, you know, I, I was very, very down and angry on, on Saturday. I think when me and Lou uh, did our thing, I think I'd only just sort of mellowed a little bit. I don't know if Lou might have a different opinion. You tried. But, you yeah. tried, mate. <laughs> I, tried. I, I, don't, I don't think, Steve. I, I don't think that they fully concentrate me. I, I, that that's what I think it is. I think they they are struggling for concentration. You know, they you talk about the decision costing you. We had the decision midweek against Sunderland, two penalties, two blatant penalties um, that that weren't given. I, that, the, 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 for me, you, you have that that is so obviously glaring you in the face. Definitely a penalty not given, and then you have yeah. this one, which I think is painfully obvious that it's not a penalty given. And it's like but his arm goes nowhere near the ball. That's yeah, where the, I don't the arm goes away. Also, the ball, yeah. you look and you look at the and you look at the replay, Jay. What makes it even worse is you look at the replay, you look where she stood. She couldn't be stood in a better position. Yeah, she's looking right at it. Yeah, no, no, it's not you know the TV gantry angle to me, it does look like it strikes the back of the arm. I think it does hit the arm. I just don't think it's a handball though, because it's that it's the proximity think, of it. Wait, it's wait, like here, doesn't it? It hits, it hits his arm. body. Yeah. It doesn't hit his. He doesn't hit his arm, Chris. It hits his body. It's like as he's turned, he's put his arm behind his back, <laughs> and as it, it angle, you cannot tell that really. So yeah, but she could. Yeah, but she's not. Yeah, but she's not sat in the TV gantry. She's she stood there on the pitch about two meters away from it. I think. I think no. again, whether whether it's hit the arm or not is irrelevant. It's mm. the context of the where the arms going, where the balls yeah. come from, yeah. how so. much it's been, understanding football that's what it's to do with like yeah. if the arm is out here whether you've meant to hit the arm or not that's fine that's a penalty i get that completely but yeah. when it's tucked in and you're moving away from it and it's just it's just a terrible that, terrible decision. and i think and i think as well and i mentioned this on on the pod with with steve on sunday you generally get an idea from players on the pitch if they generally think a decision should be given or not as a penalty and yeah. I think there was, I looked back and I think there's pretty much one, maybe two at a stretch of Bristol City players arguing for a penalty. The whole box were not up in arms asking for a penalty. Yeah. I think they were expecting a corner. And I think when, you, when, you, when you're when watching that live and even back as a highlights, you get that impression, don't you, from players. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I was so surprised to even see it be given as a penalty. It obviously really hurts you guys as town because... You're in such a good situation. You, you've had a decent game. Yes, you probably could have scored more than one goal by the judging of the game and how it went. Like, if Radoni probably could have scored one. But at the end yep. of the day, that's come to it where three points has turned into one. It's happened against a player who you mentioned, Steve, who's you know, had such bad luck and it's in the last minute and the other teams around you have won. So it's not just one thing that's gone wrong. It's pretty much two or three all at the same time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that so that decision was just compounded by the fact that Leic uh, Leicester lost to Plymouth, Blackburn beat Leeds. Uh, I think the only mm. uh, uh, Birmingham beat Coventry three 0 I mean, I said to you, Lou. I literally it. said to Lou on the podcast. If you just said to me on Friday night before the Plymouth Leicester game, Plymouth will beat Leicester, Birmingham will beat Coventry, and Blackburn will beat Leeds, and you will have a chance to beat Bristol City, but concede a penalty in the hundredth minute to a handball that should have never been given. And I said, go put a bet on because you're going to win millions of pounds. Like You'd maybe win 900 you know. quid for that. Nah, uh, <laughs> cheers, Dave. Thank you very you're much, welcome. mate. Quid. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't, but you don't want a, a 900 quid, still 900 quid. Yeah, 900, um, you still know, 900 you... quid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave. All right, stop being facetious. <laughs> but yeah, um, there we go. Swansea next, Steve. Um, team not really playing for anything. Swansea, in, you know, banging middle of mid table. Um, are you optimistic about that one? How are you feeling going into that one? Yeah, well, they should be on the beach, but they beat somebody I think com <laughs> comprehensively a couple of weeks ago, two, three nil, was it? Um, so you never know what really Swansea's going to do. They, like I said, they don't have much to play for, but you know, they might they might decide to turn up. I hope that they don't and. And we get the win that we need, but I think we need to win the next two, Steve. I, 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 and and I'm a bit worried that Birmingham will beat Rotherham, and then we'll probably need to win all three, including obviously beating Birmingham. It's going to be so sad if we go down. Like I can't be bothered playing Lincoln next year, but you know it's probably oh. going to happen. So 
Hey, good news. <laughs> to be fair, I look at like the League One situation, and you know, with Stockport and Wrexham going up, and the likely teams that will go down. And actually, looks like it won't be. It's it League One next season. Certainly, Quite isn't exciting, really isn't it? Or... I don't want to play crap teams like Lincoln, mate. I want to play decent teams like <laughs> Blackburn. Like, I cannot Blackburn, wait for Lincoln to finish you know. the League One title next season because I really would put money on that right now. And I think yeah. you would as well from the way you were talking about League One under Brighton writer. Um, in all seriousness, though, looking at League One next season, worst case scenario, I would definitely fancy you for top six. It's going to be a good, good division. Is, uh, uh, the so the problem with... They're out of the League problem... One two seasons. Yeah, but the problem with it, with it, Chris, is that there's a lot of work needed to our squad, and I think you, I think you know, Kevin's going to have to spend seven, eight million, even if we go down anyway. There's a lot of these players that need to go. There's a lot of players actually that's still in contract, so God knows how we're going to get rid of them. Um, and that's the most worrying thing. It's not like you know, at, at, at other clubs you've got quite a number of players out of contract, so it's probably easy to shift them on. At town, that's not the case. I think we've got five players out of contract, and that's about it. We'll you know, one of them... do it though without you know, should the worst happen with a fairly small net spend because you'd think you'll get worst case scenario three or four mil maybe for a donor alone, and that's half of what you were talking about needing to spend for next season. So, actually, your overall net spend probably wouldn't need to be that much. And I'd say because of how, uh, how much weaker. It looks as a division next season. I think you'll be fine. I genuinely think, like, yes, mm. the kicker in going down, but it's not like you've been relegated out of the football league or that sort of thing. It's league one, you've got a chance to bounce back. I said, yes, no, no, I, would be a no, I, yeah, keep on as well. No, I, I, I listen, I, I understand about not being relegated to the national league. I, I get it, it could be much worse, don't get me wrong, but you know, we're talking about my situation being a supporter of my football club and going down is never a nice thing, especially if it's the fact that Birmingham could relegate us. And, and 20 years ago, um, in 2001, they relegated us uh, on, I think, the final day where we had to get four results to... to basically, four results had to go against us and we had to uh, beat Birmingham. And all four results went against us uh, and we lost to Birmingham. Like... So, you know, it, it, that that season was a mad season, apparently, and I just feel like it could be deja vu again, even though I don't remember it and I was only five. But for a lot of town fans, they were scared, scarred by that season. And, you know, it could be a shame if it happens again. Um, interestingly, apparently on that day, Birmingham fans said, we'll, we'll never see you again. Well, we all obviously ended up dead. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a bit de- it's a bit depressing right now. Um, Swansea's like you say, Steve. Just going back to that, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a tough game. We just need to give everything for it. The club's doing a quid for a kid, so get your kids down there. Um, and I'm just fill the ground, make some noise, and let's get behind the lads. Um, because what else have we got to lose? What else have we got to lose? We must have been listening, Steve. What? What do you mean? We must have been listening to us after saying fill the ground and get everybody there. Oh yeah, yeah, there must have been, yeah, because well, that's what I said, mate. Wasn't it like mm. just give free ticket, free tickets to kids at schools, and you know, just f- honestly get every every seat filled for that game, uh, for the last two home games, and just make as much noise as possible. Because I don't see us staying up any other way, Lou. That's the problem with it, mate. Um, maybe, you know, maybe uh, maybe yeah. Nagel should uh, mention Leeds in a in a diary again. That probably help. Yeah, I'm not I'm not <laughs> answering that, Jay. Not answering that. <laughs> it's it's difficult down the bottom though. It's it's really hard. I don't, you know, you look at the other sides now. Stoke and QPR probably need one, two more points um, to get to forty nine. Blackburn, like you say, probably are safe now. So it, it's really in a four race horse. It's me, us, Birmingham, and Chef Wednesday. Yeah, three. Th- um, Plymouth could be dragged in, but. I want to thought so. Oh dear, Downsy, you sound so depressed, mate. I'm sorry to see you in this state, pal. I really am, honestly. We don't uh, like it when well, we're uh, defeated, mate. Be, be even game. worse when Lincoln come and beat us 5 0, and Chris will be like, whoop. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should have a West Yorkshire football show. Actually, I say I'm saying nothing, especially because it's Lincoln. 
Yeah. It's a good battle of the equal title. Is it over for Lincoln? Lincoln playoffs are done now, aren't they? You've, you've yeah, we... Uh, up, I've not seen it, but apparently it was a horrific referee decision that <laughs> actually cost us that game, but I've not seen oh, it. Oh, well, these things happen, Chris. These things <laughs> happen, do you know what I mean? Yeah. They happen in every game. You've just got to move on, mate. Get on with yeah. it. <laughs> exactly, mate. And I will when we look forward to seeing the next season. So, But the problem is, Chris, there was no point you going through the playoffs because we all know that you, Lincoln is the most symbolic club in, in the playoffs. So We are, but yeah. I think it would be different, actually. Scavala's really turned things around at Lincoln. I, I'm very optimistic for the next oh, season. Yeah. Anyway, Thank let's carry on. Scoops. All right. Come on, then. Let's move on to, uh, to non-league. We've got him on the show. He's here on time. He's been here for the whole show. We really appreciate it. It is... Dave Lewis Foy, aka Shaman Stats. Hello. Um, Dave, good to have you on, mate. Um, slight Welcome slip back. up in the race for the playoffs, a 2 0 home defeat uh, against Barnet, mate. Not ideal. No, a 2 0 home defeat. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah um, Barnet just held us at arm's length from 15 minutes, two long throws. Just bullied it, just bullied it into the back at net. And this is one thing that worries me because they're going to finish second or third. So if we're getting into that top seven, Barnet are a team. At some point, if we are going to go up, we have to beat at least once. Thankfully, the playoffs, because of how the how they're set up, there's only one leg. So if you beat them on the day, that's it, they're out. Obviously, it swings and roundabouts, but what happened is they went 2-0 up very quickly, deservedly so. We weren't very good at the back, but then they just again I'm using me uh Invert commas there, managed the game. And the ref let them manage the game <laughs> instead of clamping down on it. And this is my gripe with referees. It's like you must referee hundreds of games throughout your career. You must see this week in, week out, and you never, ever stamp it out. Or you only stamp it out for one team. And then if the other team, I don't know, if like a team away from home is one nil up and they're just time managing <laughs> Don't do out about it. If the home team goes 2 1 up, the booking goal is straight away. We're taking too long on goal kicks. And that's I mentioned this at the weekend, didn't I? I yeah, I, I, really I, stick I, to I, my craft. Yeah, it's so annoying. Either cut it out straight away or don't do it later on during the game. Either do it for both teams or don't bother. Agree. You know, if you've got two combative midfielders, for instance, <laughs> either book them both early. <laughs> Or don't book them at all. Don't book one without the other. Like set your start. It almost like a team set your stall out early. So they basically let Barnett manage the game. We didn't threaten. Rob Harker had a couple of chances where he went through and he should have shot early and he didn't. Max Wright tried to go around the goalkeeper, didn't shoot. But on another day, it's like Max Wright goes around the goal, he makes it look dead easy and scores. You know, he scored two at Kidderminster last week. You know, it's <laughs> what what angle do you want to come from? We've lost to second in the league that are, are, are better than us, basically. But now, so close to the playoffs, Chris Millington has, has almost seen what we are going to be up against. We're going to, if, if we finish six for seven, I mean, we might not even make it. I'm talking as if we're going to get there. We're going to have to beat one of Bromley or Barnet away from home to, 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 to qualify for Wembley. I mean, a bigger pitch at Wembley, I think we might do a bit better because the sheer pitch is one of the largest, widest, longest pitchers in the National League. And I think it plays into our hands sometimes if we do it properly. I'm going to try and steer away from talking about playing away from the share because obviously I've more than had my say privately in our WhatsApp groups, but something has to change. Otherwise, we're going to come up against this this time again next year. We'll, we'll have good weather through August, September. Only one spot been played on it. Not gets done. Two sports get played on it, bit of rain, no consideration for the other teams that play at the ground, and the donkeys are on the pitch again. <laughs> Dave, I've got some, I've got some like good news for you, though. I've got it's some like good news for you. Though. I've got some good news for you, though. At Wembley, the, the, at Wembley the Swamp yeah. Donkeys don't play on it, mate, so you, you're all right. <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's not their problem. If their game can be played on it and it's deemed fit to play, they play. They they, they are co-tenants of the Shea Stadium. It's all the politics around it. They're at home again, uh -huh. not this Sunday, the Sunday after. If we're drawn at home in the playoffs, if we somehow finish 4 4 fifth and we have to have a home tie, going to be a real headache. So the club's doing everything in its power to just 
gradually just trip up and just fall over that finishing line and get six for seven for Avalon, push for four for fifth. I think Gates said are playing tonight. They were 2 0 up at home to, again, getting back to beaches already on the beach, Chesterfield, who were putting up no opposition. We have Ebbsfleet tomorrow who are still battling to get out of the bottom four. We're playing teams that still have stuff to play for. Again, on the reverse, though, if we beat Ebbsfleet, Southend and Oldham cannot catch us. There's only really Aldershot that can catch us, and they've, I think they've still got Gateshead to come. I mean, again, that came with its own little politics of Gateshead had a game, a game called off last week against Aldershot due to the pitch, and the noise was coming out of Gateshead, but almost... I mean, they made a, a, a club statement. You could you could look at it. They almost yeah. leaned very heavily on Aldershot really didn't want to play us. You know, and obviously Aldershot have sort of said, well, you know, we've come up, we've had to stay in a hotel, we're hanging around, we don't know what's happening. It's not the right preparation for a game, which is fine. But, but try to weigh both up from a fairly neutral point of view, it sounds very much like Aldershot didn't want to play that match. Yeah. They'd rather a little bit more time tick on and just see where they're at, which is almost a bit like what Halifax are doing, to be honest. Like, we're, we're not sure what's happening with the pitch. We've had postponements. We've had teams obviously playing in and around us. There weren't too much damage done at the weekend. I think Aldershot lost 3-0 to Boreham Wood later on. Um, I, I can't remember if Gateshead played or not. Oldham drew away at Oxford City, who have been relegated for weeks. Mm. So the results sort of went for us, almost even. They, they went how can I say it, like we, we lost, but in a fashion with all the other results, we kind of half won, like the, all the results went for us, it's it's very yeah. strange. It's a bit can you like... send your luck my way, Dave? That'd be nice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Better luck. I mean, actually, I've been listening to the show and Jace were breaking down Leeds' performances and did we deserve something from here? Did we deserve something from there? And to be honest, in the 43 games we've played, I think we've got what we've deserved out of this season, like... We very rarely had a game where it's like, we really should have won that. And we've, I don't know, drawn or lost. Like, we've tended to get what we deserve out of games. Like, we lost to Barnet, and I've obviously just run through, like, scored two early goals, very direct time, managed it. But we didn't do enough when we went two down to warrant getting back into the game. We had a couple of good chances, but we haven't capitalised on it. So, in the end, we have deserved to lose that game. I'm trying to think back over the season if there's any games where we haven't won or got something from a game where we really should have got something. I mean, you could argue the Chesterfield away game were a bit like that, but we give ourselves a mountain to climb by going 2-0 down. You know, we battled back well. Possibly a draw would have been a fair result, but they just had that rub of the, gir rub of the green that top teams have where Joe Cummings, who's a young centre-back, ended up having to go battle with Joe Quigley, who's quite an experienced forward, and Quigley used his physicality Again, a bit like I was saying, top teams kind of get the decisions. Like, if that had been the other way around, that would have probably been a foul. But you see him given, you see him don't. You know, some are given, some aren't given. And he scored and they won the game. You know, we, we thoroughly destroyed Chesterfield at the Shane, and thoroughly deserved to win the game. There were no ifs, buts about it. You know, we've drawn with Oxford at home earlier in the season. And by all accounts, that was a fair result. Like, there's been very few games where... It's gone either way. We've tended to get what we deserved, and we were seventh because we we almost deserved to be seventh. We haven't fluked as we're there. No, indeed. Um, it's a crunch of games coming up as well, Dave. Yeah. The schedule's so tight. It's Ebbsfleet tomorrow, and then it's Oldham on Thursday. I think you're going to be playing at Chesterfield. It's at Chesterfield, really yeah. Um, how, how do you see this week unfolding, Dave? It, it depends what happens tomorrow, because as I say, if we beat Ebbsfleet tomorrow... The, the Oldham game almost becomes a non-event because Oldham can't catch us. I think, I think it's currently... I haven't looked at the table, but... Go on, Ben, I've got it here. Oh, good, yeah, have a look. I, th I think it's if we win, we get 69, and Oldham can only get 68. Or we can yeah. get... We, we'll yeah, go up right. to 70, and they can only get 69. It's, yeah. It rules them out pretty much, and it certainly rules... I mean, look at where South End are. They are eighth, and they had 10 points knocked off at the beginning of the year. And I know we've, we've obviously touched on it as the season's gone on. They've had an incredible run of form. Mm, yeah. So are they going to be that team that always seems to just come up on the rails and gets into the playoffs at the last minute? There's always like that one unexpected team that seems to get there. Are they going to be the ones that are going to usurp us for our seventh place? Because it's not going to be Gateshead, judging by how they're going at the minute. Yeah. 
that's where I am on Saturday, Dave. I'm down at South End because it's against obviously nothing to play for Rochdale. It's funny you talk about looking back though over the course of the season because I did this early with Rochdale. Mm. He looked in and thought, how have we not made the first with the squad that Rochdale have got? Well, I can tell you why, because you're giving players like Harvey Gilmore player of the year, who's just yeah, a box standard in the field. He's actually been genuinely the most consistent, like never putting less than a 7 out of 10 all season. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's been fairly slim pickings, but mm. it's without a doubt that he got he got players player, managers player. and support. Yeah, he literally just like sweeped up, didn't he? But yeah, I'm saying yeah. that now and I'm thinking in my own head. We're not we're not doing too well at the minute, and Florent Hot using midfield is a little bit like again what Jason said. If Somerville plays well or Buendia played well for Norwich, Halifax or you know Norwich Leeds do well. If Hottie isn't playing well, Halifax don't play well either. And he's had a couple of off days. You see, and Millington to his credit against Kidderminster gave him an hour. And once he'd been ineffective, I said it to my dad. We watched it because it was on TNT. It was live on telly. I said. We haven't heard Florent Hottie's name said a lot in this commentary and we haven't seen him on the ball. He replaced, I can't remember who come on for him. It was another midfielder. It may have even been Jack Evans and we seem to have a bit more push towards goal. We were a bit more attacking after that. I mean, that were a game where if Kidderminster had scored, it could have been a different outcome. But once we went 1-0 up, we we were comfortable in that game. It was like they'd obviously now been relegated officially, but they pretty much surrendered at 1-0. But yeah, it's yeah. Florent Hot. He's not doing too well at the minute, and I think he got subbed quite early against Barnet as well. He was on uh, he was on Rochdale's books when he was a kid, like Hottie, yeah, years ago. Yeah, never never made it through. No. Um, are you still feeling optimistic about the playoffs, though, Dave? Are you still feeling like it's it's going to be done? Do you think? Or... Tomorrow, Brownie, come on. <laughs> um, we're, not a, we're not doing a show tomorrow, though. <laughs> what would be nice is. We've potentially got three or six games of this season left. If we play all six games and we get promoted to the Football League, if we retain Sam Johnson, he'll play his 400th appearance for the club and it'll be the first game back in the Football League if we get back. That'd be his 400th appearance. Sorry, which would be really nice for an out-and-out Halifax Town legend with a capital L. I mean, he's he must be in the top five top ten of Halifax Town's all-time <laughs> record appearance holders. He's kept the most clean sheets of any goalkeeper to ever play in Halifax, 143. So it'd be a lovely way to, like, cap that off. He's obviously got two FA trophies in his, you know, his uh, cabinet, his trophy cabinet and a playoff win in, in uh, 2017 to get us back into the National League. I saw but, his statistics earlier, uh, Dave. I mean, he's, he's mm. away and afar the best keeper in the division, uh, statistically. Um, I've seen is, him play I mean, a number yeah. of times. He's, he's a top keeper. He's a top keeper. I'm not sure with goalkeeping statistics, statistics like that, where it's like goal stopped, whether that's like we should be defending better so he shouldn't have as many chances to, you know, shots to stop, or if that's yeah. a good thing. I mean, I quoted it and just put Sam Johnson's the best goalkeeper in the National League and water's wet because that's <laughs> how I feel about him. Like, you've got Nathan Ashmore in our, at our level who's always up there and he's a bit of a character as well which makes him a little bit more you know he's a bit more newsworthy because there's always something going on you know he's, he's gone into crowd and smacked a fan or he's doing <laughs> something ridiculous you know what i mean it keeps him newsworthy <laughs> because he's, you know, he's more sorry. subscribers gone there cheers dave thanks very much <laughs> <laughs> always he's, he's a bit of a character um but can i just on, say on, if if facts on. get to the playoff final i think <laughs> we should all get a box You'll get a box and go down at Wembley. Don't forget that would be the 5th of May and we've got this curry thing lined up, haven't we? And I've said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've literally Sorry, said yeah. I'm either going or I'm at Wembley. So. Oh, yeah, true, true. But you're coming to the curry going. night, aren't you? You're coming for the curry, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm more than likely. Also, What's your we... position, Dave? What, what type of player are you on the pitch? <laughs> I was Don't say goal. defensive midfielder, whatever <laughs> you do. <well. laughs> I'm really, really broad. He's a combative midfielder. No, we've got a keeper now. I was, a got a keeper now. I was a combative he... goalkeeper. Yeah, I used to play in goal. I'm quite, I don't know if it comes oh. across, I'm quite oh. broad. Like I've got quite broad shoulders. I like that. We've, we've all got position covers then. Dave's goalkeeper. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, that, just whilst we're talking about National League goalkeeper, actually, you were down to it. That Jacob Chapman, am I right in thinking he's out of contract for Huddersfield at the end of the season? I don't know if he's out of contract, but he's. Um, he, I don't think he. 
depends if we go down. Like if we go down, then we probably will bring him back. But um, he's a good keeper. I mean, I like him. He's played earlier this season, two games for us. So I'll be honest, you know. I was really hoping that he'd be out of contract because he'd be perfect first choice, solid National League goalkeeper, and he'd be one of the best in it because. He's only played what a handful of games since he came to Rapture on loan, but he has been excellent. Really, very, really, really good. He's very brave and his kicking is unbelievable, Chris. Like he's probably oh, the best yeah. goalkeeper that, that kicks at town by far, like far better than Nichols in terms of his distribution with his feet. But he's just it, it, the the reason he's not got in is because obviously Nichols and we've got Maxwell, so two experienced keepers above him. But I, I, I really liked him. The two the two games he played were, were excellent, and I'm not surprised he's gone to Rochdale and done really well, mate. Yeah. If you get the chance to watch the highlights from the Dale game on Saturday against Dorking, he makes two or three brilliant reaction saves. Really does. Yeah, I won't let him go. I won't let him go, Chris. I'm hoping you do. I'm hoping you do. <laughs> Good we stuff, still have man. the problem of our top scorer has only got eight goals. Whoa, we haven't wow. got a double figures. I, I wish that we, like. I, I wish that Michael had a top goal scorer of eight goals. <laughs> our centre backs, <laughs> our top scorer. It could literally go either way. We're either going to be well. There's three options. We're either not going to get there. We're going to go out with a whimper, or if if we turn up, if we turn up as I know we can, I have every confidence we'll win it. Honestly, if we turn up on the day, we will smash everybody because we've done it to Chesterfield and they've run away with it. So, like, who's to stop us if we can? Yeah. But then you've got Barnet who are just managing games out. It's literally six and two threes. If do you we think you're going to do it, Dave? Do you think you'll reach your playoffs? Do you think you're going to do it, mate? <sighs> Don't sit on the fence. Come on. I just, want be, I just want us to be altering them because they're getting a bit too above themselves, to be honest. <laughs> and I'd rather beat them and just be a bit like, do you want to pipe down? Come on, uh, Dave. Are you going to make that, the playoffs, not... mate? <laughs> Come on, Dave. Come on, Dave. Where's the answer, Dave? I, sh- I think it'll be a semi-final defeat away at Bromley or Barnet. Okay. So Good that's morning. a yes, Lou. Just to confirm, that's a yes, a yes. Halifax are making yeah. the playoffs. What 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 have Town done against Gateshead this season? Because for me, they have been far and above the best footballing side I've seen this season. Oh, Gateshead! You see again, you've got Altrincham and you've got Gateshead. We've not <laughs> lost to Gateshead for nearly twenty five years. All right, well that bodes well then, because they were. So, this excellent. season was a draw at home and a win away. Like we are Gateshead's ultimate bogey side, and we beat them in the FA Trophy final last year. So they're like. Please don't let us draw Halifax. Please don't let us draw Halifax. Whereas I'm on the flip thinking, when it matters and it's a playoff game, that'll be the game where you break your, like your hoodoo, your jinx. It'll be in the playoffs. So I'd rather just, as long as we beat Altrincham, I'm, I'm really not bothered because they've just got two above themselves, unfortunately. I, I love Artie. They're a friendly, really friendly little club. I mean, I, I'm not speaking from the fans' perspective, but from everyone that I know they're in, the, in their media team mm. and that sort of thing. Genuinely. They need to put down a peg or two. No, because exactly. <laughs> honestly, Dave, I think it's just my Twitter. Like my algorithm's just full of Altrincham fans, and I'm fucking bored of them. <laughs> <laughs> Dave jumps on F Wow, wow! <laughs> just bored. I'm bored of them. Just getting too high Dave, above them. I'm going to show you something that's going to calm you down. Okay. Go the monetization. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just, just concentrate on that, Dave. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Shall, shall we get back to the swamp donkeys? That that'll keep yeah. Dave quiet. Don't yeah. set him off again. No, no, we don't. Eight hundred subscribers, brilliant. Well, we'll <laughs> yeah. Just lost a load. Yeah, no, no, we've we're down to eight hundred subscribers and two thousand pound in debt now. Cheers, Dave. Thanks for the monetization. <laughs> offer. You're welcome. Oh yeah, that's the explicit tags that we're gonna have to be switched on. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. As Nick says here, come on, Shaman. That's all we care. I about. love how gas for the other week, and like we all said, it was it was you know okay, and then Dave's just gone and trumped that by about a billion <laughs> times. We've had the F word before, have we? So, no, we've never had the F word. It's a day full of achievements. Oh, mind you, it, it's live, isn't it? You could always just edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> just create a beat. I've got a DeLorean. Yeah. Andy, come on. Um, right, okay, let's move on then. We're going to drop down a division. Uh, Lewis, um, yes. Farsley Celtic, 3 1 loss to Darlington. It looks like it's going to go to the final day of the season for that final relegation spot. Um, yeah, crunch time, isn't it? Well, yeah, not great, is it? Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, one win in 12, massive, massive game against Darlington. Um, Darlington needed to win to stay up. And Farsley go there and lose 3 1. 
Um, not ideal in the slightest for the Celts. But yeah, there's not the, it goes down to the final day. Simple as that. It's a straight shootout. Um, Buxton at home um, is what Farsley have got, and Blythe are at home to Brackley, um, who still have something to play for for the top three for a home playoff tie. So you look at it on the flip side. Farsley have got to do the job first and foremost. If we don't, they're pretty much down. Um, for me, they've got to get the three points. I mean, again, very simple thing to say, but you just can't rely on Blythe to not beat Brackley. Blythe at home are quite strong um, when it really matters, and I'd fancy him to probably get a point against Brackley, if I'm being honest. But yeah, the game against Darlington, a massive blow. Um, first goal, watch it, just soft, just really soft from Farsley's perspective. Stunning second goal, but then just, just about, what, seven minutes before full-time, Lovely finish from Atkinson, just sets up for a really tense finale. You know, Darlington fans, there's 1,500 in there, probably getting a little bit nervous, thinking, oh, what can happen here? Um, and just Farsley just couldn't score. We did, we did chuck a, quite a few plays forward and, and, and throw the sink at Darlington, but um, Curtis Main, who's, uh, Cedric Main, sorry, who's had a, a really good season at Darlington since joining under Steve Watson, wrapped it up. And being honest, Darlington celebrated like we'd won the league. Um, after performing what they call it as a great escape, but they were down and out at the beginning of the season. They were wow, as bad as bad can be. So they've terrible, done a remarkable terrible. job. Terrible under yeah. Gowling, weren't they? Really, I mean, that was a bad appointment to start with, Josh Gowling, but they really were poor under him. So but to be fair to Steve Watson, it didn't work for him in his, uh, his previous job, but he's worked wonders at Darlow. Yeah, it, it's a super job. And I know apparently from, I was watching the interviews and stuff in the highlights and um, apparently I think he's, he's happy to talk to Darlington. I mean, I think Darlington might even throw everything at him and put a statue outside that rugby ground to just entice him to, to stay on the back of that. But Farsley, listen, they're in, a, they're in a spot of bother. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, the three teams below them have gone down in Banbury, Glosson and Bishop Stortford. So... That Southern Central Division is going to be quite heavy with teams coming down from the National League North. Market Needham, ironically, going to get promoted to the National League North. How's that for you? Um, but yeah, Farsley, last day of the season, it's all coming down to that. And we've said it, haven't we? We're sounding like a, a broken record four months ago. That should have never been the case. Um, but we found themselves in that situation. Other teams have picked up the result here and there. Farsley haven't. And that's what's got them in the trouble they're in. Yeah, I mean, Ian says here, Farsley look comfortable before Christmas. Is there something wrong behind the scenes? I mean, it's, it's who knows? I mean, it's it's difficult to say, isn't it? I ain't got a clue. I ain't got a clue. There's a load of rumours going around, but you can't say it because if we, we don't know what the facts are. Um, I think probably come the end of the season, something, you know, whether whether something has happened may come out. I have no idea. At the end of the day, Farsley have just got to look after themselves. Um, they've got themselves in this situation. They can't blame others for it. Um, yes, they've lost, you know, quite a few players that we've not been able to replace. Um, but what I will say is, I think if a good, if we do get relegated in the worst case scenario, I don't think they'll be jumping straight back up. Um, I think that Northern Premier League is going to be a really tough division for them next season. Um, but listen, we can still do it. Um, it all comes down to goals. Russia, you know, Russia Olympic can still technically go down, but they won't because of, I think they're nine goals better off than Farsley. So Farsley pretty much got to score ten goals, which. You know, I know the Bristol Rovers situation of the year happened, but that ain't going to happen in this one. Um, Farsley just got to look after themselves and hope Blythe do a favour, uh, and hope Brackley do a favour for them. I think it's as simple as that. The fact that Buxton have nothing to play for, except for it being Craig Elliott's last game in charge of Buxton, certainly you think gives Farsley that extra little bit of hope, especially being at home to, to Buxton. Yeah, I agree, mate. And let's be honest. If the players and the club cannot get up for this game, then there's no point, is there? That's yeah. you know, you, you we're not talking about the future of the club, we're talking about you know a team that could potentially get relegated when they should have been nowhere near it. Um, and you know, like I say, they've got to get themselves out of the trouble that they found themselves in. Luckily, on paper, you look at it from the outside in, yes, it's a winnable game, and yes, you could argue Brackley could get something from Blythe. Brackley, but then need, again, to, the way... Brackley need to win to guarantee a not having to play in the Eliminators, don't they? Mm, yeah, because um, obviously Tamworth have gone up as champions um, and scone for per second. Um, so, listen, they can still do it. Hopefully they can do for our region um, because um, 
it would be good to have representation in the National League North. It's just a shame again that that you know they seem to be just at the wrong end of the table when it really matters. And um, they've got out of in the past couple of years, but this is a this is a really tough ask. Yeah, absolutely. Um dropping down then, um, they didn't play this weekend, Bradford Park Avenue, but um mm. Stafford losing, Baseford losing, um a slither of hope there, Lewis. Results went away. You survive mm. another week. That light is still there at the end of the tunnel. I mean, yeah, I mean, listen, the results just went all in Avenue's favour, didn't it? Um, Atherton beating Stafford, which helped. Baseford did take the lead against Macclesfield. I was, you know, I was watching Brighouse Ponty, and when Baseford took the lead, you start thinking this could be it. That could be the day you're relegated. And then Macclesfield played three one. Report in the non-league paper. Go on. Did you read the the match report from your? No, I haven't. Made, sorry, no. I just I just wondered because I didn't see any of the goals, so I just had social media to go off for all. Of them. <laughs> yeah, no, same same to be fair, but I think basically yeah. actually will probably be really disappointed because I actually thought they might get something against Macclesfield. Um, I know Macclesfield has still got something to play for, but to be fair to Macclesfield, they've turned up and eventually got the job done, which keeps us alive for another week. We said it, haven't we, last week? Um, and I know that we've spoken to some of the people at the club. It's it's going to be really tight. It's going to be really tough. You're still hoping that Stafford lose, Baseford lose, and we win our games. I mean, that's it's a near miracle you're hoping for. We again, similar to what I said about Farsley, um, Avenue have got to look after themselves. Um, if we don't beat Gainsborough, we're down. It's as simple as that. In Gainsborough, are in the top seven of form table. I think we've got 12 points in the last six. Um, they've announced quite a few people who were retained on the list, like Savas Jackson, Lewis Butroyd, you know, Bailey Conway was at guys in this season, he's returned back to Trinity. So Gainsborough are really building for next season. Um, and um, Avenue, again, like Farsley, you've got to turn up and do the job, otherwise the consequences you get, you get relegated. Um, and to today's point and what we said earlier about the other teams, I'll always say this, the league table never lies, absolutely doesn't lie. We can't you can't throw away 30 points and winning positions and expect to stay up. It's as simple as that. Um, another club, you know, really wanting to I say packing out the horse for that's going to be tough because it never really happens. But um, we're offering free entry to, you know, football league, rugby and national league season ticket holders um, for the game against games. But so hopefully we can get, a, you know, a healthy crowd to back, to back the lads there. But um, listen, it's um, do or die. Simple as that. Um, you look after yourselves and you've got hope results go your way. Yeah, on slightly more positive news around Avenue, um, tell us about Avi Fest happening Sunday, the 5th of May, where yours truly, the West Yorkshire Football Show, will be representing and we'll be uh, having a kickabout as well, won't we, mate? Hopefully, unless we're in a box at Wembley from Dave, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> but, you know yeah, so if the club, the club are running... Yeah, I don't want to be able to get us in, Dave. What do you think? Yeah, you can squeeze us I've in. I've got there. my name down. I mean, Wembley's like our second home. Like, I've got my name <laughs> down already. Well, let's be honest, Horsfall, Wembley, I don't know which I'd rather go yeah, to. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so the, the club are doing a bit of a festival, a bit of a day, um, kind of celebrating the community. There's going to be, you know, a few games on between fans, between staff, um, and representatives from the club and, and obviously people who are able to play and that we've put our names down so if you want to laugh everybody come down and have an absolute chuckle at us trying to kick a ball we're all playing centre def- uh, centre midfield Dave's in goal Steve's <laughs> in left back um, we're having no, no. rolling subs people, we're having rolling subs so expect come, us people. to be only on for five minutes everybody's laughing I'm actually class I actually people am class in goal them. like seriously oh big head over here <laughs> People yeah, should yeah, comment, by the way, Lou. We should get people to comment. Uh, who, who, where do Come people down. think we should play on the pitch? Come down and tell yeah, us. Yeah, you know, comment on Come the live down. stream and on the video and tell Off us where we should play. Well, Lee, I look at this Lee here. He says, I, is that Steve there? He certainly is. He's right hey, up there. Lee. Top. Um, Lee, God, so come, come on down, 5th of May, and <laughs> we'll uh, get the on, lights. Yeah. But yeah, um, the club are running a bit of festival. There's going to be a load of like charity. There's bounce castles for kids. There's going to be a bit of, I think, a bit of an end of season do as well for some of the players. Um, and um, also, yeah, I think we're planning as a bit of a night out. But yeah, I mean, if anybody who is, um, oh, nice one, Dana. Um, if anybody is able to go down, please do make it. Um, the advertisement is on the website and on the socials from the club as well. Um, and I know also we'll give a shout out as well, which we might come on to Geisley. Um, Adam, who is a regular uh, follower of our 
podcast as well in tribute of his dad. We're having a day at Guy Easley, I think, the weekend before as well. I believe it might be the 28th. Um, some really good, famous names from back in the day at Geisley, who ironically used to play at Avenue. I think there's the likes of Ollie Johnson, Danny Boschel, Matt Bauer. The list goes on. Um, I think, Chris, you've just got it to hand, haven't you, mate? Yeah, so yeah, it's Sunday 28th for 2 pm kickoff. Former players including Ollie Johnson, Will Hatfield, Jake Lawler, Steve Dickinson, Matt Bauer, Danny Boschel, Wayne Brooksby, uh, Adam Boys, Nicky Boschel, Dan Lowe, Simon Ains, Jake Haston, Martin Foster, with more to be announced, I believe, as well. Um, yeah. As well, if you check guys' social medias, there is an opportunity to play in that game uh, and also to manage it. I think for £45, you can, you can play in a half. For ninety pounds, you can play the full match, and for fifty pounds, I think you can manage one of the teams that's in it. So uh, that's quite tempting. Get me too many fuelists mentality on, then uh, go, go manage. Yeah, big shout yeah, out to Adam, and, and also, it? yeah, and, and we know that Adam's a massive follower, and I know he's had some really tough times. So again, if anybody's able to go down, and this is what I know the guys have mentioned it early in the comments. You know, non non league clubs do thrive on this, and that's what they do give back to the community for people to go down. So. Listen, guys, if you're listening, uh, you've got 28th at Geisley, 5th at Avenue. Uh, let's get down and support both clubs and, and causes as well. Yeah. Um, moving on and taking a look at Geisley. Um, another disappointing result for the Lions. 2-1 loss to Matlock Town. Ryan here is not mincing his words. Happy to see Geisley bottling it after the ridiculous <laughs> sacking of Andy Wells. Ryan would say that as an Avenue fan. Let's just quickly put that disclaimer on Ryan, yeah? <laughs> um. Listen, it's not looking good, is it, on the back of Andy Welch? Um, kind of parting ways where they wanted to get some extra points. And in the past two games, they've uh, scored zero on the league ladder. Um, disappointing loss to Matlock. Probably, with respect to Matlock, one of the teams who were well out of form in the league. Um, again, watched some of the extended highlights of the game, because um, obviously wasn't there. It was another game. Um, the first goal is just... It's indefensible. Um, how that goal's gone in from a left, from across from the left on the right foot, and it's been tapped by Hardy, who's unmarked in the box. It's just nowhere no, near way good enough for a for a defence to deal with. Then he equalised the Geisley. Um, Reese Kendall seems to be almost like the helic of of non-league scoring goals from a defender. Puts one away from a penalty spot to equalise, but then you know he's kind of almost like the 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 uh the pantomime villain at the end second goal conceded kendall just couldn't get his feet sorted he's given possession away guys of defense i'll be honest is all over the place it's just very very poor defending and it's pretty easily work between the matlock front three to cross it for the guy to head in on mats in the box and two one and the game's done and dusted and guys the playoffs are well and truly over now yeah all right chris i mean you know, obviously you're you're close. Have close ties with with Geisley. I mean, what have you made of how it's gone since uh, Andy sacking? Well, it, it it was a gamble, wasn't it? I think, and whether it's you know whether it was things behind the scenes and actually they're wanting to go down a different path next season, but they've just thought, well, make the change now, get it done early, rather than waiting to the end of the season. I don't know. Time will tell, I guess, on that front. Look, we we talked last week, didn't we, Lou, yeah. about the fact that obviously Craig Elliott has been heavily linked across social media and a lot of talk about fans since his uh, announcement that he was leaving Buxton at the end of the season. It's one of those, we, we don't know, it's all speculation at this stage and t time will tell. The playoffs, it's one of those, with or without Andy, the form didn't suggest, you know, before, just before his, his departure that they would necessarily have made the playoffs anyway. I think, as I say, when, when me and Jay were there for the Lancaster game, the, the, the kind of feeling afterwards was that it was going to be a case of seeing the season out and rebuilding at the time we thought with Andy. Obviously, the, the club have opted to go in a different direction, but either way, it's going to have the same outcome, you'd think. It's going to be a rebuilding job over the summer for whoever gets the job and, and look to push for... You would think they'll definitely be wanting a playoff finish next season. You, you, because, you know, guys, it, it's a club that should be back in the National League North at the, the minimum. It's it's spent, what, most of the last 10, 12, 13 years at National League level, whether that was at the top level or in, in the North. Um, and they'll want to get back there as, as soon as they can, really. But it's it's going to be a summer of change, I suspect, at, at Nethermore, personnel-wise, regardless. And, and, yeah, see what happens. It's yeah. But I, I, I know we argued this last week, and I'm, I'm going over it again, but for me, we stand a better chance getting into the playoffs with Andy Welsh in charge than not, in my opinion. Yeah. I and mean, that's no disrespect to Tong. And obviously, we don't know if anything has happened. We have no idea. But... I, I just, honestly, it really surprised me. It's such a shame. They've had a terrible couple of weeks. They've lost a the manager. 
playoffs are over, the three G pitch ain't happening. It's a time yeah. to forget for Geisley. They absolutely need to end this season as soon as possible. And I think we're similar to what we're talking about with Bradford City. They've got to come out really early now and set that scene for the next season because yeah. otherwise there's going to be a lot more questions being asked of the club, of the board and what's happening. Um, because Geisley should be probably challenging at the right end of the table. And in my opinion, they absolutely were. Um but next season is going to be quite tough, depending who comes down, Blythe or Farsley. Like I said, I think Farsley might... I think I think Blythe will probably be stronger in that division than Farsley, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Um, but then you look at it, and it depends who goes up out the playoffs, you know, in, in Northern Prem. You know, there's probably like some Marinas, Macclesfield, you're going to lose one of them, who are very strong. Um, so, guys, the next season absolutely need to be challenging for the playoffs, because if not, then they're going to be stagnating in that league for probably another four or five years. Yeah, there is a risk, isn't there? As you say, yeah. the, the, the pitch news as well was just another disappointment, I guess. Of course, like, there's been those plans in the last over the last couple of years to put in a, a 4G pitch as a way of the club being able to rent out and making money, but it's fallen short. Um, I, I believe one of the things was, was the parking and council uh, planning restrictions wanted one thing and it just wasn't going to work for the club so they had to pull the plug on that idea for, for this season. What I will say is I think that pitch is certainly going to need some work doing to it because it, it when we again when me and Jay were there a few weeks ago it didn't seem quite as smooth as it has been and, and Nethermost always had a good pitch but mm. it was a lot more bobbly than I ever remember it seeing it you know when it was there more regular. Um, yeah. And, and, and you know what, Chris, you, you've probably been involved, well, you, you have been involved more than me and people who are watching this and on the panel know, Geisley towards the end of the season just seemed to fade away in quite a lot recently. And actually, that's when you should be peaking. You know, again, this season, they've had a very shaky beginning of the season. Then they've peaked to get close to the playoffs, in the playoffs. And then all of a sudden, we've just faded away again. And it's the same yeah. old story for Gazi fans. And I do I do actually feel sorry for him because that mentality just seems to have just stuck with him for the past two, three, four years and it needs to change for Gazi to be successful again. Certainly, ever since that last that last season, actually, no. You know, when, when there was that run of games where we were just dropping closer and closer to that bottom, uh, well, the bottom one as it was in that particular season, that one relegation spot and, you know, obviously Kitty... He couldn't have come much closer to keeping guys to be fair in the National League. Literally, goals in a, a last minute, couple of goals in the last five minutes of the game at Alfredton. And you, you do wonder like how things could have been different if changes had been made earlier. You know, if, if they'd just done all they could on the pitch, they could have just stayed up where guys would be now in terms of a National League North. But hey, it wasn't to be. And, and they've got to kind of, you know, step the, the ball by the horns and, and plan for the future as soon as they can. But, you know, going back to what you were saying about putting. You know, setting the stall out quickly for next season. I completely agree. I think as soon as that um, full-time whistle goes at Workington after the final game, then they need to be, you know, getting things kind of set out of right. What is the plan for next season? Who's going to be in charge and and where things are at going forward? Yeah, so you can't accept another season of this, can you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, Lewis, just before we go then, what else has caught your eye uh, around the region in non-league this uh, this week? No problem. So, just catching up on some of the leagues below. So, I went to watch Brigger House against Pontifact uh, Colliers on Saturday. Um, and this is where the business end really comes into play as well in non-league and in the East Division. So, let's be honest, it was a very much of a non-event that first half. Big House fighting for the lives. Paul Quinn back in charge after about 10 years away. Um, and first half, nothing in it between both teams. Then I would urge anybody to go and watch it on the highlights on Ponty's socials. Yeah. The first goal comes directly from the second half kickoff from Ponty. Connor Smythe has hit it from halfway line straight over the goalkeeper. First kick of the first half. It's it's pretty much perfect. Um, and from there, that's really rocked Big House. You could see confidence just kind of slip away and, and, and Ponty just dominated for the rest of that game and, and, and comfortably won 4-1 um, despite actually a really nice goal from Brighouse as a consolation so for Ponty that means up to fourth, Belper lost ground so that means uh, Ponty about four, uh, three points ahead 
Two yeah. big games for Ponty now. at home to Sheffield tomorrow. All being well, the pitch is fine. And then Grimsby Borough on Saturday. So for me, I'd expect Ponty to be in the playoffs. And for me, you're quite a dark horse. I, I, I like the way Ponty set up. They're not spectacular, but what they do is really effective. And they seem to close games in a very short period of time within the 90 minutes. And uh, it's really effective how they do it. For Brighouse, on the other hand, if any, everything could go wrong, it did. Um, all the results, unfortunately, went against them. Obviously, the loss against Ponty doesn't help. Um, basically, means Brighouse at the moment are in the bottom two. And yeah. they've got some really tough games coming up. Away at concert on Tuesday, away at Stockton, who are likely to be champions, depending on what Hebben do on Saturday. Um, that will be a massive blow for Brighouse to fall out of that East Division and into the North East Counties League because um, they've been quite consistently an established East club for quite a while, even despite, this, you know, restructuring the leagues. Um, and I don't think many people probably have big house to kind of struggle um, as the way I've done, but the few times I've seen them, unfortunately, they just look void of confidence um, and it just doesn't seem to be working um, at all at the moment. So maybe whether who whether Paul Quinn stays, what the new manager looks like, depending on what division they're in, there's probably going to be a bit of restructuring, I believe, at Brighouse in the East Division. Livisage mid-table, not much to play for at all. Um, they've got quite a few games, Heaven. massive games coming up. Yeah, Hebben tomorrow, then the home to Carlton on Thursday, which could potentially do Ponty a favour, and then Ashington on Saturday. They've got to play three games in the space of about four or five days because of the situation with the pitch there. Um, so yeah, Liverpool not much to play for, but they can finish this season strongly. And wrapping up in that division before I move on to the other leagues, just, just quickly on Liverpool, Lou. Liverpool are playing at Emley just to, in case we've got any groundhoppers yeah. or people that like to see different yeah. grounds. It's not actually played in Liverpool; they're playing at Emley. Good shout, mate. Good shout. So yeah, go to Emley. That's a really good point, mate. Osset United, massive, massive win against North Ferry, but huge one 0 win. Didn't see that one coming. They've jumped uh, Brighouse in that league. But away to Carlton um, on Tuesday, again, affects Ponty, affects Brighouse, and away at Brid on Saturday. So basically, Osset now it's in their own hands um, to potentially get out of trouble, which does obviously affect um, Brighouse. Um, so hopefully, somehow, one of them stays up, both stay up, uh, but that's going to be really tricky. Into the North East Counties, um, kind of the only one that really affects our region is uh, the playoff race. So at the moment, for those that weren't listening last week, I'll Oh, it's massive. It's great. It's really exciting. And what I will say is I'll put a call out for any people who listen. And I know that's some from the division listen. It'd be really good to get some of these guys on um, next week or the next two weeks. Likes of Emily, Campion, Garfith, um, and depending what Albion do as well, um, and Peniston. So Peniston beat Silsden 2-0 down and then eventually won with last minute 3-2 in a thriller, which keeps their playoff hopes alive. Um, the only team that can catch is Albion Sports, who are in the last playoff position. And if Peniston beat Nesborough on Wednesday and away at Barton, they will reach a playoff simple and goal difference. That's how tight that is. Um, so that's really exciting. And finally, unfortunately, I do leave on a bit of a sombre note for the Northwest Counties. Um, uh, actually, I will come on to another thing actually after this is we spoke about last week on Saturday, um, both Ilkley Town and Route 1 could have got into the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't the best weekend. Unfortunately, Holker, all boys beat Ilkley 5 0, and Route 1 lost 3 0 to Exton Villa, which ends both their playoff hopes. State and end the season in 14th, five points above relegation. So, listen, the guys at Ilkley and Route 1 have done an amazing job to push it so close. Um, it will be interesting to see what the situation is next year, um, both whether they stay in that division. I'm guessing Ilkley will do Route 1. Potentially question marks if they might move to the Northwest Counties East, but we'll see with the uh, with our organisation on that one. Um, but both have kind of really been a credit, I think, to our region in that area as well. Yeah. Um, and finally, again on a on a really tragic note as well. Um, last week, unfortunately, between um, Wakefield and Ponty, if I can call it is um, West Riding County Cup. Ponty were leading four 0 and unfortunately. Um, it was a medical emergency and a player for Wakefield, um, Jacob, unfortunately, um, unfortunately passed away the morning after. It's really tragic, um, really sad news for a region, really sad news for Wakefield. Um, and obviously we're there on Saturday um, and Ponty were there in a minute silence with what obviously affected them as well. Um, so, yeah, thoughts go out to, to both Jacob's family, friends, everybody connected into Wakefield as well, because that's just really tragic, which... 
obviously it's horrible to end on such a sour note, but I think it's one that you know it's one of those situations which is had to call it because it's um it's in our region and we wish everybody all the best. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely indeed. Um, great stuff. Well, I want to thank everybody who's watched along uh, live tonight. If you're watching this again later, do please smash a like on the video. Subscribe to our channel as well. We did make it to a 1,000 subscribers, which is uh, a very great achievement for the show, and hopefully it will continue to uh, grow going forward. But, yeah, get your comments in, subscribe. If you're listening on Spotify, please do leave a rating and a review as well. I want to thank everybody who's been on the show this evening as well. Jason Booker, Stephen Downs, Chris Bell, Lewis Sale, David Foy, and earlier Gareth Walker as well. We will be back later in the week. Um, I'm sure myself and Jason will probably get together, won't we, at some point, mate, yeah. and get some new content out there. Um, we, uh, so... We're going to have to do the review after the uh, the game on the Monday night because there's no way we're going to be doing a review. Uh, no. Well, not me and you, anyway. No, Chris no. might have to host and take you... everybody else because we'll be you watching do uh, it. Leeds Middlesbrough, won't we? So... Oh, is, is that Monday night football next week? Monday night, yeah. You don't want to watch that crap. Get on here. <laughs> got no choice, mate. It's 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 like it's part of part Five of who you are, isn't it? Yeah. I've got a better sentence. idea, Ben. The better idea will be do if a we watch along. Pitch up and do a watch along just to watch. Yes. This Yes, no, I no, want to no, see. It will be, it will, no, honestly, you don't want to see. Yeah, that. I there will be more expletives in the watch along happen. than there will be tonight. I want. <laughs> I want to see Steve's eyes. Turn to absolute nothingness as it the top two points slip away. That'd be magnificent. Oh, that you oh, concentrate God. on your own house, you Steve. <laughs> oh, he's bitten there, hasn't he? He's bitten. I really do watch all the playoff games because it'll just be oh. entertainment itself. Look oh. at that crowd, he's distraught already. It's the word playoff on that. It's only, it's it's only, it's down the line, I'll tell you. It's still a bit of entertainment I'm going to get this season, Chris, because, you know. <laughs> Obviously, with our situation, but yeah. Well, we're going to be doing the Euro pods as well, aren't we? So we're going to be having a bit of a England takeover on the pod. And you're Dave's not talking about that. Okay. <laughs> what? Dave is. Dave is talking about this. We're expanding from the West Yorkshire football show just for the summer. And yeah. we're going to be looking at the uh, Euros. So hopefully oh, we get some nice nice review. Fun. Get some debates going. It should be uh, should be fun and games on that. Cool, one, so cool Palmer's having a shout at the moment with his hat trick yeah. and a six 0 yeah. at the moment for Chelsea. So he's have, we, have we all been seeing the penalty uh, nonsense prior? Yeah, I did. We, I thought we, we were rebranding. By the way, Brownie, I thought we were rebranding the the Positive Southgate podcast. That's what we're <laughs> rebranding to, isn't it? <laughs> we can give that a go. Yeah, why not? Offering them for England part. manager Chris is his agent. <laughs> Yeah, oh, we're going to have some tasty debates over the summer, I'm telling you. It's going, Can't to, be wait it's going to be good. Um, great stuff. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll be back next time. Thank you.